We have um, a Mr. Don Reedman, a local resident on Chamberlain, uh, is going to be calling in, obviously, with our new uh, protocols on uh, COVID-19. We uh, have to do this by call-in, and so, um, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, at least we still have the process to be able to allow for our delegations. And so, this morning, Don Reedman's on the phone. Don, thank you for calling in. Uh, we apologize that we can't host you in person, but uh, we uh, appreciate you calling in and the floor is yours. We have Councillors Parslow, Javetkov, and Councillor Earl uh, in the uh, attendance in chamber along with our administration and Councillor Kempf is on the phone. So you can go ahead, Don. Hello? Yes, go Don't ahead. Here. Yep. Can you, can you hear me? We can hear Very you. well, thank you. Okay. What I'm, what I'm talking about is the, the, the encroachment that I am on my land here. I'm about 15 to 20 feet, or not exactly which, because somebody's taken my, taken my uh, rods out of my, you know, the measurement rods I used to have them there, and they, they've disappeared last fall, so I don't know who's taken them or what happened. If you guys took them or that somebody was surveying or what, but anyway, they're gone. So I'm not too sure where my property ends anymore. I have a good idea, but... That's one thing, and I do, I guess I'm going to have to pur purchase the property, but I don't like the price. I think they should just give it to me. I cut the lawn back there every every all winter or all summer and keep it in nice shape, and so does everybody else here. If you ever walk down ours, it's like it's like the cleanest cleanest park in in Dawson Creek, the small one. It's only small, but everybody keeps it nice and clean and uh, so forth. And you guys want to. Tell us we well, you've got to buy this little chunk of land. Now, the land that I own, or I'm encroaching on, it's got two big spruce trees on it. I mean big spruce trees. Now, if I try to move my fence, I don't think I can put it back in front of the trees, down to the roots. And there's, there's a third one on the other side, and I don't know if it's on your land or my land, because my, my, my post has disappeared. So I think you guys should just realize it. That, that fence has been there for over 35 years. And everybody, that I, that I think the back lawn back there, when the government had it, everybody cut the grass, which I did for, I've been cutting the grass for 15 years. And now all of a sudden, we've got to move our fence, which I think is ridiculous. That's all I want to say. If you want to give it to me, that's okay. But I don't think I have to pay $5,000 for three big stumps in my yard that can't be used for anything. All right. Well, I wish you'd reconsider either making a transfer or just let me leave it. I, I just just can't see tearing that fence down for what likely cost me between two to three thousand dollars to tear it down and put it back up the other side. So I, I just don't. And then of course I got a little shed on there that's been there for I don't know how many years. Ron Graham gave me a letter when he uh, sold this place to me. And unfortunately, I can't find it, but I think he said he lived here for about 15 years, and everything is as, as it is today was there when he bought it. So I just cannot understand what in the heck, what the heck is going on. Anyway, that's my complaint. Thank so you. I wish you guys would reconsider. And all. And another thing I'm really, really pissed off about is you guys hiring out-of-town people to look after this thing. And you preach by locally. Thank you. Okay, now you can talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Don. And so for just a little bit, of, I'll just give a little bit of history. So over the last three or four years since uh, there was a major uh, development occur in, along the creek bank that it got a complaint raised to council about the encroachments uh, there. Um, when we uh, investigated that, it was determined that there were a number of encroachments into the city parkland that required us to have to deal with them at that point. And so we've held about three or four different public meetings over the last three years with the residents down there to talk about what the issue was and how and what we were prepared to do to try to deal with some of those encroachments. And that's where the city got to where we said we're going to now um, redefine and ensure that we have the property lines clearly established. And so yep. for those folks that wanted to have the opportunity to purchase the property um, and legally we have to do that at market value because it is public property and um, and then uh, started that process of engaging with the residents to say if you have encroachments 
and you want to purchase it, then we'll uh, determine a value and how that will be done. And or if you don't want to, then you just are required to remove the encroachment uh, and the infrastructure. And uh, so that's where we're at today, Don. But I'll leave it yeah. to council now and we'll open it up to anybody that has any questions, comments. And we'll, uh, I'll pass it on to administration. The only thing I'd like to say is sure. that fence has been there for, for about 35 years, and all of a sudden I've got to move it, and it wasn't me that put the fence up. It was put there, and, the, and it must have been approved by somebody, when, of course, there's no, no record in, in the city hall. And then there, not only that, there's uh, just another thing I got. I've got water in my basement, and I, and I went down to town to check and see if there's weeping tile down there. Well, they've got a picture of it, but nobody's ever inspected to see if it's there. So I, I'm really up the creek. Yeah, so the, there was a number of encroachments, Don, and even residents who purchased property from and through uh, the realtors where the, the fence lines and the fence, the infrastructure was built on city land without any permission or without any indication. But that, and that took place over the, as you say, over the last 30 or 35 years. And it was as a result of a complaint that was uh, given to the city over some of the encroachments that were being built that caused us to do the investigation. And that's where we got to in terms of there's people who have built permanent infrastructure attached to their homes that are encroaching. So it's been a significant issue. And as I say, we've been engaging with, I think we've had three or four different public meetings with the residents talking about what options and things were. Yeah, um, I, was, I was at most of them. Yeah, okay. This is Dale, I don't know if this is Dale or not. But anyway, I was at most <laughs> of the meetings and last, except the last couple because I was out of town. Sure. But which I realized what was going on but I, in my opinion, when that lady put that wall in, I think she did the city a favor. Because when that creek comes up and, turn, and makes that turn, it's going to erode, in, and not maybe this year, but the next 10 years, she's going to erode, and it's going to take that whole land out there and we'll go right into her house. So no. that's my opinion. I'm, I'm not a, a, a geologist or anything, but uh, you, can take, you can just walk along the creek here, and you can see how it's eroding. Back every every once in a while, it's got it's gone but back a foot a year or maybe six inches a year, and it's keeping eroding on, on certain spots, and that's where the curve is. So it's going to erode there eventually, and it's eventually going to go into her place and a few others. Anyway, yeah. I guess I'm, I'm not making any headway, so I better let you guys well, go. No, and I just want to answer one more question. I want to Blair answer okay. a question you had, uh, Don, about how and what we hired somebody to do the evaluation. So, Don, it's Blair Lextrom talking. So, understanding your concern, had the city not yeah. gone to an open public tender to secure that yeah. uh, the work, then I would understand. But we went out to a public tender, so uh, that's our obligation on behalf of the city. Yeah. You have to put it out. Well, so it was. Yeah, and I, I, well, I, I still think you should have hired somebody locally. That's the thing. Is it, it, then rather than somebody out of, out of town, that's my opinion. Because you preach that all the time: buy locally, buy locally, and then what happens? Sure, I can run down to Grand Prairie, but it's not cheaper to go to Grand Prairie because it costs me for gas. I, I understand that. But this is the same thing. I don't know if you guys are paying this person travel or not, you know, back and forth and back and forth. But anyway, it's just just my opinion. Yeah. Not, not, nope. But when you, you guys preach it, then you come up with this from another from out of town that but, people looking after it. I don't, I don't appreciate it. But wait, wait, because when wait, wait, you guys preach, you say, buy locally. Well, maybe you had to pay a few more dollars to buy locally. You should have got it locally. Anyway, that's my opinion. Oh, anyway, right. uh, I guess I will likely have to buy the land, but I'm going to talk to the girl here again and see if I can get it reduced because I can't remo remove those trees because they belong to you. I guess they belong to you. I don't know who planted them. And they're too big, and the roots are too big, so I can put the fence back. I likely couldn't get the post in the ground. So that's my... I'm so I likely have no other option but to purchase it, so... Anyway, maybe we can get the price reduced a little bit more. Anyway, I'll let you go, and thanks for talking to me. Okay. Th thank you for calling in, Don, this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, bye. Have a good day. Okay, bye. Uh, item three, new councillor business. <coughs> Councillor Earl. Uh, thank you, Worship. I just wanted to take a moment to follow up on a uh, comment I made under new councillor business at the last uh, council meeting with respect to the community cleanup campaign. Um, so, so far, it has been, I would argue, a uh, resounding success based on the information I've received from staff. Uh, it looks like we've had uh, upwards of 470 garbage bags and 22 recycling bags 
uh, uh, picked up from our various uh, pathways, roadways, ditches. And I just wanted to uh, reiterate my gratitude to all the community groups and businesses and organizations who took the time out of their uh, busy couple, I usually say busy day, but we've, due to the COVID-19 protocols, we've had to spread this out over a couple weeks. So thank you to them and thank you to all the commuters who kept an eye out for them to make sure they were able to do it safely. Thank you, Councillor. Good job. Uh, any other Councillor business? Councillor Parswell? Yeah, I attended a Mile Zero Part Society meeting um, by Zoom. And um, the uh, as a result of the discussion there, um, the Society is uh, wanting to organize a in-depth uh, visit by Council to the Mile Zero Part Society uh, to um, give a presentation on what's been happening down there over the last 10 years or so, to refresh Council with the history of the um, whole Walter Wright uh, Park development and the relationship with the city, and um, just to uh, also give a hands-on tour of the facility. So you'll be getting a, a letter of uh, invite for some time like in August, okay? Um, and I would like to um, have an item on in camera of a legal nature uh, that I want to give you an update on that does in involve the city and uh, one of its societies. So I need to give you an update. Okay, on uh, society? On a, a progress of a legal action against okay. cities are part of that. Good. Thank you. Anything further? Uh, item four is our minutes. Four point one minutes of a regular meeting of council for May eleventh for adoption. Councillor Parslow, Councillor Earl, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Any business arising from those minutes? Correspondence, item 6.1, 6 we have a letter from Jeff Guinard, Executive Director of the Alliance of Beverage Licenses. That's Councilor Parsley. we receive for discussion. Thank you. Second, Councilor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Kerry, go ahead. Um, I think uh, this request uh, is something which I, I, I suspect we would have unanimous <laughs> Uh, the position of council members uh, on this that we should do what we can. Um, so I'm not sure about the ask other than um, being aware of, this, of the plight of the hospitality industry and being flexible in our um, accommodation of requests, I guess, for um, patios, etc., etc. And so my question is, how, how uh, do we respond to this? I'm not sure. Do we um, discuss this, staff discuss with, with the planning department and, and, and let people know that we would be willing to accommodate requests during this, uh, this summer period? I, I just don't know, but I think the need for uh, expanding the capacity of restaurants, cafes to for customers uh, beyond the confines of their buildings is a, a very necessary thing if they're going to stand a chance of surviving this uh, problem we're dealing with. Yeah, I'm, and so Blair, I'll pass it on to you, but I believe it's an issue with they're looking for support to the BC Liquor Inspector who gives them the authority. Yes, that's the, my understanding of this. So the way it is, is to have any alterations, they're permanent uh, also, uh, is what they look for. So they're looking for the flexibility during this uh, time of the pandemic, is what they're after. And they're long lasting? Well, they would, as I would understand it, you could make a permanent application or this could be a temporary as you're moving outside, as you're trying to find additional space to make sure you meet the social distancing. And I also heard that they're uh, changing the laws with respect to how the restaurants uh, handle takeout. And they can also, I believe, um, 
are changing that to allow them to take uh, deliver alcohol uh, with those food orders. So mm -hmm. that's a change as well to the past practice to accommodate the COVID issue. So my understanding was this was a letter of support they're looking for us to provide, Blair. Yes, your worship and yeah, Council Park. So but we need if we I think we need to communicate this potential uh, to our local business community. Don't we? I mean, it would be an ideal thing for sure. This is a letter of support, so uh, they would become aware of it through if they're members of the association, or we can post it. Um, it will be a determination of council as well. Mm -hmm. It will come. Yeah. Another re it's related yep. to this topic. Um, we um, received twenty thousand dollars, I believe, um, from NDIT, and it was, you know, the it was a great deal of flexibility on how that m was used. Money was used. For instance, it could be used for. For the smaller businesses that couldn't afford it for the plexiglass protection, right? Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if uh, some of that money could support this sort of uh, development. You know, I think they're flexible. Um, <coughs> when we were talking to them, they had different ideas and they told us to inform them. They wanted to work with us on that. Um, surprisingly enough, you look at the cost of plexiglass partitions or whatever, the $20,000 that uh, is forthcoming from NDIT is it's going to be limited as to it will help offset some costs but it certainly won't meet everybody's uh, requirements I'm sure. And I did discuss it with Sioux uh, Community Futures because that program was administered I think through the Community Futures and when I mentioned that on a weekly call we have with them that each specific request has to be made individually they can't do a blanket that you're going to allow uh, for plexigla plexiglass as an example. So. so, motion? We write a letter of support. Okay. Uh, Supporting the initiative? Yeah. Okay. Second? <coughs> Councilor Earl? Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And item 6.2, we have a letter we received from the Aurora uh, Parks um, in and Park. Move the receive for information. Thank you. Second? Councillor Earl? Discussion? All in favor? Sorry. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, 6.3, uh, Community Futures uh, request for a letter of support and uh, we received this with the intent to uh, try to fund a regional business liaison person in the South Peach region. Councillor so Parsley. Parsley. Thank you. Second. Second. Councillor Earl. Discussion? Well, there's three positions being established uh, yeah. in the north, so we should take part in it. For sure. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carry. I'm just going to hold for a minute because uh, I think our CAO is, we have a technical has a technical issue with we'll be keeping right on the agenda. And so. <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, next item we're on to is item 6.4, the UBCM 2020 Award of Excellence, uh, Community Excellence Awards. Receive for information. Councillor Parslow, receive for information. Second. Councillor Javekov. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. <coughs> At 6.5, we have a letter from Catherine, Catherine Conroy, Minister of Children and Family Development, uh, regarding Child and Youth Care, uh, Youth and Care Week. Chief for information. Councilor Javekov, second. Councilor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, we now move to reports. Item 7, 7.1, we have report 
20038 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding our Climate Incentive Revenue Incentive Program. Councillor Parswell. I'd like to move the report 20038 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding the Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program public report be received. Further, the Council rescind the carbon fund and offset purchasing policies. Further, the Council approve the reallocation of 151918 of carbon fund reserve, the general capital reserve, and further, the Climate Action Revenue Incentive Program public report be approved as presented. Thank you. Second? Councillor Javekov? Councillor Sorry, Amy, I got Councillor Javekov. Um, any discussion? I just Councilor want to Parzo? note that this is, in, in part, this is cleanup of past actions. Yep. Um, the, the, the middle core of this resolution is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great job. Thank you, Flavie. You're welcome. Further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Um, 7.2, we have report number 20050 from the General Manager of Community Services regarding our facility lease agreements. Councillor Parzal. I move the recommendation number 20050 from the General Manager of Community Services we facility lease agreements be received for discussion. Thank you. Second? Councillor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Go ahead. So essentially, Managers basically uh, seeking direction from council, and I um, would like to start at the, this by uh, highlighting the one of them. Computer's just oh. just yeah, under it. control here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. The Lakota Centre, the Dawson Creek Stables and Arena Association. Um, this uh, seems to be a well run and, uh, and there's no criticism at all about it. But um, I do believe uh, the, we need to discuss with this organisation um, that the, the amount of the uh, utility fees, uh, we should look at recovering that proportion of cost um, and uh, suggest to the society association that they um, review their stable rental fee as additional source of revenue uh, to the society. So I'm just flagging the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm told over many years that um, the vast majority of users are rural residents. The rental stable fee, a stall fee, is very low. And um, I think that the cost of the utilities and necessary maintenance there that we have to participate in could be offset by an increase, uh, them taking care of the utilities. Just for investigation, I mean, and that's not direction, but you're asking for feedback. That's one area that I believe there's some, been some discussion on. Um, the rest I don't have any, uh, any uh, feedback to provide. Um, I, unless the council wanted to take a more drastic uh, action over some of these uh, facilities and their operation, but um, I don't think we're in that position. Thank you. Councillor Earl? Thank you, Worship, and through you to staff. I do, uh, similar to Councillor Parsley, I have a couple questions with respect to the Lakota Centre. Um, <clears throat> I know, as Councillor Parsley mentioned, a lot of those stalls are being rented by rural residents who bring their horses back out to their properties during the summer and essentially because the cost of renting a stall is so low leave them empty um, you know the facility is built to benefit the public and to have half of it be half empty for half the year because people simply don't need them and people who would perhaps like to pursue the hobby are unable to secure space for them uh, or conversely, the stalls are being sublet 
by the people who are renting them, which from what I'm aware is not supposed to be happening, but has been. Um, so I would like to see uh, some tightening up in some of the oversight there because uh, I, I appreciate it's a well-used facility and, and people enjoy it, but we do have to bear in mind if we are subsidizing it, the expectation it is that it's going to serve the public's interest and not a small segment of uh, people who are in there right now. And also, just a follow-up question while we're on the topic of the Lakota Center, I do understand that as of the end of the month, their staff or the majority of their staff is being laid off and they're closing under the assumption that they are going to be in the phase four of reopening. Um, and they seem to be under the impression based on conversations they've had with us. Could we get, is, is that accurate? Or are we expecting that to be closed potentially until there's a vaccine or an effective treatment for COVID-19? And if so, how is that going to impact the term which expires on the 31st of December of this year? Thank you through your <laughs> worship, uh, Councillor, you, you are correct. Uh, they have closed the stables um, until further notice. I suspect it will be step three or four before they reopen. There was some confusion. We did follow up with one of their board members. There was some confusion in in, in where that direction came from. Uh, the city ourselves have not provided or insisted that they close. They just felt that their business model at the current time with COVID was not sustainable. They weren't able to, to uh, keep uh, have many people going through the center. So that decision was made at their own level. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Javekwa. <coughs> so, I think that we have to review all of these uh, leases, but uh, alternative one, uh, which is given the financial implications of COVID-19, Council may wish to maintain a status quo on current lease terms for the balance of 2020. I think that's, uh, that's the way we should proceed here. Uh, every time we talk about increasing fees, COVID-19 comes into play and you know these organizations are having as much difficulty with revenue sources as we are and businesses um, but I'd like to see us take uh, each one of these leases and review it in detail and uh, you know the Lakota Center has been mentioned but KPAC is another one that uh, because we don't expect any revenue we develop a lease based on the city not getting any revenue <clears throat> that gives the board of directors the uh, that are managing the facility um, basically free reign they can you know provide really low uh, rental rates for their uh, clients and um, because we pay the utilities there's no issue on uh, driving up utility costs, whether it's, you know, inadvertent or the the uh, um, example in KPAC is the uh, the Pottery Guild. Yeah, they're they've got two uh, heaters <coughs> heaters for heating the the pottery that run on an ongoing basis and they're, they're high wattage. And uh, I haven't seen, uh, we've talked to uh, staff before about getting a, an idea of what, what the rates would be for a year, you know, f just for that particular aspect. And we haven't got that yet, but, um, you know, I think if we start the discussions on a lease, based on okay the city wants ten thousand dollars a year to recover ten thousand dollars a year for our costs or on that basis so that there is an expectation that there's a fee there's going to be a fee there then the the management managing board proceeds on that basis so rather than provide uh, a rental for a room for nine hundred dollars a year which is basically nothing, 
they would say, okay, we'll we'll rent the room for maybe uh, five hundred dollars a month, you know. But because we we don't have any expectations, they've got the freedom to just basically give away the facility to the users, and that's that's not really fair. I mean, <laughs> you know, the other thing is that a lot of the users are rural. They're not participating in the costs of these facilities at all. Plus, they're getting uh, benefits that, you know. So I think what I'd like to see, and you know, like I mentioned before, that we need to continue our our discussions about, um, you know, taking money out of operations and putting it into capital. And this is part of that. If we, you know, I'd like to see us set up some meetings and go over each one of these facilities and um, they're all they're all unique they're all there there's nothing consistent with them they all have their own uh, aspects to them but we need to look at each one and develop an expectation or something that we can go to the board with and say look this is this is where we're at we want to recover some revenue and uh, and then it's up to them to, to develop a management plan for their clients based on based on that like to me some of the things that are happening um, are just it's ridiculous you know and it's not it's not us we don't have any management role in the facility itself but we should have some expectations and and that's something that would be in the lease so like I don't know how we proceed on this I mean everything we do is based on emotion and uh, I guess if if nothing else I will be bringing up motions you know starting probably the next meeting to try and set up a, a plan or a, a process for dealing with some of this stuff um, you know I don't know how else to deal with it because like it's been sort of set aside but uh, if we're going to have meetings now, if we're going to increase meetings through the summer, like you mentioned, you know, there's a there's going to be some time to to maybe deal with some of this stuff. But, anyways, for for the immediate, I would like to see us uh, use alternative one, which basically is the status quo for 2020, and then in the meantime, we start uh, you know a, a process there that we can identify. Um, sort of criteria start for starting 2021. Okay, thank you, Councillor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so to just to weigh in to, and to reiterate something, both Councillors Parzel and Javetkov. Javetkov. Sorry, it's uh, Monday morning for me. Uh, Javetkov touched on. Uh, we uh, we did have a discussion, I believe, when we were discussing the tax exemptions for nonprofits. We pulled all the city properties out of that basket with, uh, I don't know if we reached consensus, but there seemed to be something resembling a consensus that the best way to pursue uh, reducing our subsidy, reducing our financial burden with respect to city properties was to pursue uh, a portion, having, having those properties for whom we're paying the utility cost, uh, take over paying a significant portion of their own, not only to uh, recover some revenue, but also to create an incentive for organizations to be more mindful with how they're using utilities and, and in that sense, hopefully uh, give them enough of a stake in reducing that usage to further reduce cost to the taxpayer. Uh, as with many of the things we were working on two or three months ago, there's other other considerations have kind of monopolized our time and of course I'm referring to the COVID-19 but uh, I, I'll support alternative one because I do agree that now is a tough time to uh, look at those increases but I would still as we return to some semblance of normalcy and people are able to fundraise again and get back to opening their facilities and, and getting revenue in uh, look at uh, the first step in this would be as a I don't know once again that we don't pay utilities on all these facilities or, or the utilities aren't as much of a burden across the board but I do think that is a good first step 
and um, I would look to pursue that in addition to uh, obviously each agreement being unique. Thank you. Ross? Thank you, Worship, members of council. Just a couple of comments. Um, in our initial conversations with leaseholders, one of the comments that came back uh, immediately was, where did our direction come from? So, you know, we're staff is here before you today, seeking that direction, recognizing the situation we're in. This year, staff are beginning the work of reviewing our fees and charges in anticipation of amendments in the next year per, per council policy. Um, in our lease policy, in our fees and charges policy, there is a provision where we can go back and start calculating the actual costs of these facilities. So sub costs, operating costs, utility costs, everything, and putting those numbers together and then going to our thresholds for cost recovery and the public good that each of these organizations bring back. So to Councillor Javadkoff's comments, I think we can start that work and start calculating what those actual costs are. So I'm not sure if Council could provide a, a, a um, Alternative number three actually provides that, uh, uh, or speaks to rather a fixed management grant in lieu um, commensurate with, with a percentage of operating costs. So that could be the start of this work. Thank you. Um, you know, there's, it, was, it was mentioned very briefly uh, as well, and so I think our second or third strategic priority for 2020 is our sub-regional funding, and um, this, I think, is, a, is an excellent example of, uh, it was touched on briefly, I think, by uh, Councillor Earl in regards to the Lakota Centre and the high users uh, from, uh, that are non-residents of the city, but here's a million dollars. Uh, some of it was included in the analysis we did, but some not. And uh, to me, I think that's another, we need to overlay that into this discussion as well in terms of saying, wait a minute, how are we functioning here in terms of the services we provide? And are these services we want to continue to provide? What's going to be the policy for that? And then how are the, how's the funding going to flow into that? And from what? User fees, is it going to be a grant? On, and the support from that sub-regional. So I think that's another layer in here in terms of how and what we look to provide the um, services that we provide and we're saying yes we want to continue to provide them in these least uh, there's six or seven of them here but I think that's another layer in there as well so um, council your uh, administration would uh, and I think that's appropriate for us to be able to provide that direction for the least uh, folks as well to be to be able to begin to have that discussion with them Councillor Parzal I would like uh, staff to expand uh, the alternative three. The, the Ross just made ref reference to count, uh, alternative three. Um, so, you write, council could direct that the city pay an annual fixed management grant in lieu of operational budgets and that the association then manages and pays all their expenses. <laughs> this grant would be commensurate with a percentage of operating costs. This grant would exclude capital improvements typically borne by the city. Now my reading of that, right, is if Society X has an operating cost of, let's say, a million dollars, and we're going to provide a grant of 10% uh, to these various groups. They would get $100,000 from the city. If another society, uh, quite a frugal society, manages its stuff very, very carefully, has uh, uh, spent 10000 they get $1,000. Is that how... In not for, ignore the numbers, but those illustrations, is that how you see it working? Generally speaking, A yes. fixed percentage, mm -hmm. uniform percentage to each of the groups. At least that proposal would incentivize uh, what things that uh, Councillor Javakov has been talking about, watching your expenses, right? However, what if they don't do that? They'll just get a larger grant from us. 
suppose in one year it was a million and the next year it's suddenly risen to a million one, they'll get a bigger grant. Am I right in interpreting it that way? Yes, I believe you are. I mean, the, the crux is going to be determining what those operating costs are. What's reasonable, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, we did the Exhibition Association and we built a lease agreement with them exactly around that fund foundation that here's the here's our utilities, here's our insurance, here's what you're going to get for a grant uh, from us now under your lease agreement. My understanding, administration? Correct. Thank you, Your Worship. And, and, and the big variable here is also the public good. There are groups that do contribute back into the operation. So really need to understand that piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Councillor Giveco? Um, <coughs> Alternative 3 provides that we are providing the grant this year. Like, I still think that Alternative 1 for this year is appropriate. However, the the costs that you talked about, so that, you know, and I still think that we should look at, at every one individual, but we need the information that you mentioned of what it's costing the city, um, what the public good is, um, what their budget, I mean, their, their uh, expenditures and, you know, their budget information, so that this, that we can look at each one individually and come up with a, you know, a proposal to discuss with them. Um, so I would make a motion to that effect that that we start that process based on the status quo for this year, and then start start that process now with collecting the information so that we've got a comprehensive. Uh, information on each one of them and then we can go through uh, and develop a plan uh, so I'd make that motion thank you so the motion is that we're going to go with option one status quo for 29 2020 with the intention that we're going to schedule meetings with the groups to get their operational uh, so council understand the operational aspect and put together the information that Rod talked about for what the total cost to the city including capital I mean it's all part of it um, we had issues before when we talked about uh, daycare where it was going to be neutral. You know, the revenue was going to cover the operational costs, but lo and behold, after the fact, the capital costs came into the picture and they were significant, like thousands and thousands of dollars for capital to accommodate the daycare, which wasn't in the picture. So I think we need a total, you know, the complete picture so that we can you know come up with some kind of a plan individually on each one of them so a motion mm -hmm. to have a seconder councillor parslow i have a second cool i may i yep. see i i will i think it's work to be explored but i think we're going to find uh okay. one size does not fit all we i just i said but let's do the exploration okay Claire? Your Worship, just for clarity and for Ross as he moves forward in this, I think what I'm hearing uh, through previous discussions and this one here today is that although 2020, we're going to leave it status quo for this year, the work will carry on, uh, we'll bring something back, but it would be a combination if I'm hearing the Council's discussion properly uh, between alternatives two and three is what I'm hearing you ask for. I, I just want to make sure. Uh, the work that went into this was based on council saying we want to look at our lease agreements how do we get to cost recovery was one of the draws in that discussion so it talks about uh, the leasee paying their utilities their insurance there may be a mix but is that the thrust of the motion I just want to make sure so we have clarity as we go down this road <coughs> yeah and I, and I think one size doesn't fit all that's why I think every one of them has to be dealt with individually because they're all, they've all got their own um, situation. And the, you know, I, I think, I like the, the idea of the annual grant, but it has to be based on information. Yeah. Um, because one size doesn't fit all. Like if you, if you uh, apply a 10% grant or something and, uh, it's going to be all different it's you know it's going to be different for each each one 
So I think the information, if we start that process, and then we start discussing it, get the information, and uh, I think it'll come together on what what we should be doing. I just don't I don't like the idea of saying, okay, here's a building, uh, just go ahead, set yourself up, and you know, do your business. There's no fee, there's no cost to you. Uh, do whatever you want. Um, and and like you say, there's rural people that comes into the picture big time. Um, I don't know what the percentage is, but it was 30, 40 percent. Generally, the quota is 60 or 70 percent, but the other facilities are, you know, our daycares were running 30, 40 percent rural. And uh, it's all part of it. Funding and who's paying is mm -hmm. uh, a major piece of it. Blair, is that good? No, that's fine. That clarifies. Okay. We'll bring all of the options. Ross, I know we'll work on that. So. Counselor Ross. Yeah, no, just with respect to uh, information we get back from staff, I would uh, like be looking for, you know, various options. But number one, A, either if we're going to be subsidizing operating costs, what incentives can we put in place for people to constrain those or some sort of cost recovery or alternative model to that? And, and yeah, just to reiterate the points made, one size doesn't fit all, not only with respect to operating costs, but also with respect to uh, fundraising capacity, revenue streams. I mean, there's some a couple organizations on here where if we were to fund them at 10%, we would probably be, of operating costs, we'd probably be worse off than we are now because they're very, very capable fundraisers and others where uh, the organization would cease to be able to function at 10%. So, and once again, uh, as Ross mentioned, we do have a policy around calculating community good, and that is something we do have to keep in mind in addition to the dollars and cents. So, yeah, I can support uh, Councilor Javetkoff's direction. Thank you. Councilor Kemp, anything? No. Thank you. Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. Um, 7.3, we have report number 20080 from the corporate officer regarding our 2019 annual report. <laughs> Councilor Javeka? <coughs> Move that report number 20-080 from the corporate officer re-2019 annual report be received. Further, that the Dawson Creek annual report for 2019 be made available to the public for review and comments. Further, that June 22nd be designated as the annual annual meeting at which time council receive will receive any input from the public before considering final approval of the 2019 annual report. Thank you. Second, Co Councillor Parslow. Discussion. Any comments from administration? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you for that. 7.4, we have report number 2082 from the City Planner regarding a development variant permit for 1801 109th Avenue. Councillor Javeckoff? Mine isn't up yet, but I'll move that we oh. provide uh, approval. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor uh, Earl, second? Uh, I'll, I'll read the recommendation just for the benefit of the public that uh, rec the report number 2082 from the city planner regarding the development variance permit 2004 be received and further that the development variance permit 2004 be re re approved to vary zoning bylaw number 4115-2011 by decreasing the rear panel parcel line setback for a principal building in the RS1 zone from 7.5 meters to 6.11 meters to allow for the construction of a covered deck at 1801 109th Avenue. Discussion? Comments? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. 7.5, we have report number 2083 from the finance manager regarding the 2019 capital asset status report. Councillor Parswell. I'd like to move the report number 20-083 from the finance manager. Re-2019 capital asset status report be received for discussion. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councilor Earl? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Go ahead. So, uh, thank you for the report. I just, my computer is got a Lechstrom disease here. It's been maybe ask, maybe ask, maybe ask him to come over and give you a hand. 
<laughs> so, um, just this is uh, for discussion because I just have a few questions uh, about it. Um, it re the report states under the side head in asset management plan, starting in 2020, the finance department will be working in conjunction with other departments to create an asset management plan, which will help to guide the city in making the best investment cities for the city's infrastructure in the future. The asset management plan will incorporate the condition of the asset, the required level of service, and the resource required to provide the service to aid in future capital decisions. Um, then I go and kick myself because I didn't see the last part. <laughs> it says here, see the attached asset management plan, project plans, and I didn't look at that. I must apologize. But the question I wanted to ask, um, that's my mistake, was... Um, the, I understand from previous discussions a year or two or three ago that some of our facilities had not been included um, at that time, two or three years ago, in the asset inventory. I recall the assets at the airport. I understand the Incanner Event Centre. Um, so, does the plan incorporate Everything. in totality all Including that? facilities. Pardon? Including facilities. Including all the <coughs> facilities. Now, this city hall, right, has been, from the point of view of the asset management, right, is uh, basically zero, right, in because of its age. Um, the Incanary Event Centre, um, will that have a 50-year, do you think, uh, lifespan? Uh, I would, uh, through your ship, I definitely need the assessment of those with the expertise about the um, the quality of the building, the, the, the level of maintenance to determine then how many years it's included right now. So there's not a fixed time no, for it, any it, facility? No. Oh. We do have, uh, through accounting standards, we have uh, numbers of years of depreciation. But that is accounting standards. So that's why we need, when we talk about asset management plan, uh, we go further um, to analyze it. Is this really enough numbers of years for a replacement? Or do we need, it's a short term, long term, so that's where we need it. Uh, experts to to do this type of review. Claire, I think an important part of this as well as we move forward is as we look at our facilities. And a good example you raised was City Hall. Um, we have to, on the financial side of this, as we manage these plans, start putting money away for each of these facilities. They will be retired one day, mm -hmm. and we will need funds. It seems we have for quite some time uh, realized a, a capital need, whether it be a building with no no asset management plan with a fund put away, a city hall fund, for example, a memorial arena fund, uh, and can events center fund. Um, all of these do have a lifespan. And when they reach that lifespan and need replacing, um, presently we don't have funds put in place to replace those at the city of Dawson Creek. We then deal with it under a capital discussion which I think as we develop and talk about the asset management plan, that is going to be probably, uh, from my view, one of the most fundamental and key issues uh, that we begin to develop for our city. So, Just to put that, uh, I think it's a, a core issue when it comes to this. Thank you. Councilor Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, and, and compliments to staff on a, a very fulsome report. So the the I don't want to say magic number, but 8.9 million should be invested annually to maintain the existing asset base. Now, to um, Blair's point, he was just discussing. I'm presuming that 8.9 million annually doesn't include what we're saving up for to replace. That's or is that included in that? Yeah, so your ship. Yeah, this 8.9 is mainly depreciation of the current historical amount of the buildings, right? Yeah. So when we talk about uh, um, 
the replacement cost, we had an assessed value by uh, uh, the survey, and uh, it is current just facilities would be to replace 312 million. So, depend of numbers of years, and <coughs> so that the amount of needs to be saved can be pretty okay. high. Okay. And thank you. Just facilities. Okay. Thank you. Just facilities. Just building. Just building. Just building. Yeah. Yeah. Not Wow. That was the one that really stuck stuck out for me in the report was the value of the buildings. But you know, when you think about it in terms of all of the facilities we own, recreation, yeah, uh, city hall, airport, all, on and on and on, it does it yeah. does you do you do see how easily that can add up very very quickly, right? Exactly. In terms of pools and event center and arenas and curling rinks and city halls and all of that. Councilor Earl? And yeah, just to, to touch on that and back to a point that's been raised a couple times throughout this meeting is our, I think, largest single uh, building expenditure is for <laughs> recreation or asset basis for recreation. And once again, that is not something that is being utilized strictly by residents here in Dawson Creek. That's upwards of 40% of that usage is from people who don't live here and aren't uh, contributing meaningfully to the tax base to help offset those costs for us. Councilor Parzal? A few things I'm a little slow with, and, some, and this is for some reason capital asset stuff is one of them. In that figure, a, a direct questions, just the, the encounter event center, multiplex, and the airport are included in that 219? Yes. 212, yes. Million. Okay. And so the of that, what is it, 100 million for the multiplex? <laughs> I need to go through the report. It's almost 200 pages, but we have for every single facilities. Yes. And then what is the current uh, historical amount, right, after Not the depreciation? No. And then how much would it be to replace <laughs> those buildings? Yeah. Okay, so that's a big one. Okay. Can I? <coughs> Uh, so on the uh, that the multiplex with the pool, the event center, and the Lakota center, and through the referendum to build it, it was only to build it, but there was nothing in the uh, borrowing bylaw or the bylaw itself to look after the uh, eventual tangible capital asset of the replacement of that facility. It's just for construction. No, it didn't good. carry operating, and it didn't carry replacement. Yes. Okay. That Thank you. Councilor Javekov? Um, I just had a specific question there on uh, cycling improvements. 1.3 million value. Sorry, what, what, are, what is that? Sorry, uh, which page specific? That's on replacement costs, replacement. Um, I saw that. Page 5 page of 11. Page 5. Recycling improvement. Yeah. Um, would you recall which one is that? Uh, no, I'm just looking here. It's yeah, it's on the, there is a transportation master plan that was cycling, put, in, cycling put in together in 2013, where it was assessed that for <coughs> cy yeah, cy cycling improvement. I, I can investigate further because this is a report back from 2013. Is that the walking trail? Or? Yeah, no, I'm there was sure. cycle trails. I believe Cycling council trails. made uh, an effort to enhance the cycling, similar to what you see in the larger centers. You'll see some cycling lanes uh, on our street. streets, for mm -hmm. example. That was a decision of council back in the day yeah. to try and promote that and enhance it in Dawson Creek. Snowmobiling might work better, but uh, this was bicycling. So <laughs> cycling, I mean, if it's revisited, uh, it's an asset that we could maybe eliminate and focus more on things like streets and sidewalks well very in the much future. i mean this is one we talked about the buildings and i raised that question i think we face a similar challenge with our roads i don't think that will jump out as a surprise to anybody in this room or probably living in our community today we've got to uh, under local area service improvements right now residents have the ability to turn down if their road needs to be repaved um, they can turn it down. If they turn it down, that cro cost doesn't go lower. Actually, two years from then, the whole base may be gone and the cost doubles or goes higher. So we have to find 
I think a more equitable manner of setting money aside for the roads in the city of Dawson Creek. We have a 10-year uh, plan, we have a five-year plan, we've got to find the capital to fund that. And right now, as long as a residential uh, group can turn down a, a local improvement, uh, those costs are going to continue to increase and be borne by the majority of the taxpayers in the city. So we've spoken briefly about it in this room before, about a new method of trying to fund roads and the servicing of those, but that all falls under the capital asset. I guess specifically I was wondering about the cycling improvements. There's 1.3 million uh, estimated for improvements in the five-year plan. Um, to me, I mean, cycling, yeah, I could see Vancouver needing cycling paths, but what I see here, um, you've got a, a trail down the side of 116th Avenue between 17th and 8th Street, but there's nowhere to go after that. So it's not continuous. It's So it's something that I think, you know, we need to revisit in the future. I uh, just wanted to make that point. But the other thing, we've got a, the master plan was done in 2013 uh, for transportation. And then we did the review of the condition of the streets in 2015 and uh, there was a set amount that was recommended for just for maintenance not for upgrades um, so does this plan consider our our success on on meeting the requirements and uh, because it's the the master plan they're suggesting three million a annually in in upgrades and um, I don't think we've been meeting that uh, goal. Mm -hmm. So does it follow through with all of these different plans and actually how much we're spending and kind of where we're at in, in the end result? Uh, so um, you can jump on. But right now, this was the master plan suggested at the time when they are done uh, analysis of how much would be the replacement. Uh, not necessary. we follow exactly what the master plan said within the period of five years or in this, within the period of 10 years. Um, I know for the road, I would let uh, uh, Kevin explain, but we are trying to use uh, this master plan that was created in previous years to, to set the replacements, uh, but not necessarily are following exactly what was said there, or you need to allocate 2 million or 1.3 million within the five years. So that was based on money availability in the year that we had the budget, and then find what was the most needed at that time. Am I correct? Go ahead, Kevin. With your worship. Um, Flavia is, is pretty much bang on there. So those plans guide everything that we do. And, and like you say, some of those plans are a little bit out of date. But um, every time we look at a capital project, we look at all those master plans uh, to help us you know, steer where we go. The pavement condition assessment that you talked about from 2015. So as we complete a road, we uh, update that information in our GIS system so we know that that road is now complete and it's gone from, say, a poor condition to a new condition. So that's accounted for. Um, as far as dollars spent in the last couple of years, um, last year we were right around that $3 million. Uh, this year we just awarded a tender for 15th Street, albeit it includes some underground, but we're at you know, $4 million, so we are starting to see that increase in that work. Um, and out of the pavement condition assessment, they, one of the recommendations is that we increase the maintenance costs, uh, the patching amounts, which council has done. And again, this year we included more money for that patching. So we are starting to uh, hopefully make some headway out there, although we've got lots to do. Thanks, Kelly. Go ahead. Just uh, <clears throat> so my understanding is that this plan, you are attempting to keep it up to date in accordance with what we're, what we're getting done. Um, it's not just the projections from the 2013 and 2015. It's the actuals yes. that we're injecting into this plan. That's what I understand. I know what we, uh, and again, it's you've got kind of the accounting side, <coughs> which, uh, and then you've got the engineering side. So as we, uh, on the engineering side, 
update those roads and actually construct or maintain, we update the systems and provide that information and I'm making the assumption on Flavia's behalf that that uh, I think it's tied back into the zone. Yeah. And that overarching strategy for us of getting 85% of that piece of agreement money allocated into capital then gives you a much more capacity and I think that's probably been what's tied Council's hands is not having the financial capacity. Councillor Parzal? Uh, excuse me, belabor in this, it's, it's just trying to understand it. <laughs> so this chart on page 5 of 11, I think uh, either I'm off base or Councillor Javakov's off base. Um, I'm drawing back to the cycling improvements. The heading there is is replacement cost. So we had a very progressive master transportation plan presented and adopted by council in 2013, right? Now Councillor Javakov, I understood, was interpreting this to be uh, $1,300,000 worth of improvements around cycling because it uses the word cycling improvements in the heading. But the column talks about replacement. So I was interpreting it that we're going to spend there's a need in this plan for us to spend 1,300,000 replacing existing cycling paths. Councillor Javakov, as I understand it, and do correct me if I'm wrong, was looking at the category and it says cycling improvements. The master plan certainly had a whole bunch of improvements in it, particularly uh, cross town connectivity on road allowances that weren't necessarily developed. So there'd be more walking, more cycling. Okay? So I'm totally confused. Um, are we talking improvements as a la the master plan? Or are we talking replacement of what already exists? Just focus on cycling as an illustrator. Sir, Your Worship, I think before we talk about a specific line on the master okay. on the master plan here, we need to understand this report as a whole. And the objective of this, the goal of this report, is to say that we have different master plans created in different times of the the last years, and uh, uh, as and um, we need to have one specific document where we can set out the master where we call asset management plan and that's what the goal we have when we listed this uh, specific items category per transportation master pavement master the idea here was to say okay this was the report available this is what the report was talking and at that time in 2013 for a cycling improvement they said you need to spend 1.3 million at that time when the report was put together. So if you ask today, how much have we spent? We need to go back and see um, in the last five years or eight years, how much we have spent specifically on the cycling area. Did we create new ones or did we just improve it then? Uh, have we spent more than 1.3 million? I, I can't confirm right now if that master was fully fulfilled. But I can guarantee that at the time when they put that master plan together, they said, if you want to replace what you have right now for improving your cycling, you're going to need 1.3 million. That's what the reports are saying. Thank you. Further, oh, go ahead. One last question. Uh, again, a specific line. <laughs> sewer. Um, sanitary sewer master plan. Uh, 8 million. I thought... Help me here. There was a figure around twenty something million for the um, sewer master plan. I mean, I thought the trunk main line north of Alaska Avenue here was eight million odd dollars. So where is that? Can you help me? Why that's eight, not twenty odd million? 
the three worship. Um, the total number wasn't that I wasn't trying to get, but you might be thinking of the storm sewer master plan, which came back, and I was pushing about 30. Miles. No, not sleeping. Okay. okay. So the sanitary master plan, uh, and, and I'd have to ask whether you used actual numbers or the numbers out of the plan, because the numbers out of the, the, the plan at the time would be lower than what our actual costs mm -hmm. were when we actually built it, because the, the trunk bypass line that we built, which you're correct, was pushing about eight million. Right. Eight million. Yep. In master plan, I think it was around five. You know, so that's why you get that discrepancy in numbers. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway, we're going to have one common document that takes it all in. Wonderful. Yeah, that's Good job. Good luck with this development. <laughs> yeah. Great job. Thank you, Flavi. Great Clear job. everything up. Uh, Blair, do you have anything else? No, I think we've summed it up. Really, this is based upon a master plan that is presented and accepted by council at one point, and then the work goes on and it transitions over the years. And as Kevin had said, I mean, if something was eight million, but when this was put together, it was costed at about five million. Four years later, five years later, it may certainly have a different uh, price tag to it. So, one one of the really positive things I think that we're demonstrating and uh, accomplishing here is we're getting to a tangible capital asset plan that we're required to have, and really is the guiding document for us as council for the future of our city to ensure we have that financial picture in place for uh, what we're required to do. Very much. So, great work. Uh, 7.6, we have report number 2084 from the finance manager in regards to our consolidated actual to budget variance report. Councillor Parzal. Move that report 2084 from the finance manager, re consolidated actual to budget variance report, March 31st, 2020. We received for information. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Councillor Javier. Can I just ask a question about the budget process? Sure. Um, I see by March 31st we spent quite a bit of money. I just wondered when we approved the budget. What date? When that did we? It was April 27, but this is operational budget, so we still need to be issuing paying vendors as the budget is in the process of payment. We can't hold for three months, no payment, nothing for operational expenses. So this is a regular procedure that we, ha we have followed. We did not release it uh, for capital budgets, new ones. We did not uh, start to work on new projects as of March 31st, but operational expenses, we still need to pay salary, we still need to pay vendors uh, regular maintenance and, and so I, I don't understand the question. <laughs> I guess my concern is that you know our budget process is it ends up we're approving it quite late in the spring and uh, in the meantime you know we're spending considerable amount of money so it seems to me that it makes sense to move the budget approvals earlier um, even if it is operational, I mean, we do have some concerns about operational costs, especially now because we're trying to move money from operations to, to capital. So yes, uh, through your I ship. guess that's my concern. Yeah, and I, I, through your ship, I do understand your concern, and that's why this uh, last year I tried to start it uh, early, the budget process, so the presentation of draft one numbers, which actually is pretty much the same that has been approved on... Uh, on April, it was discussed by December. So the numbers of operational majority of them were present and discussed and approved on draft one. So then on draft two, which was by the end of January, so that was when the operations now are starting to run, we went through the whole process again. So if we talk about officializing the bylaw issuance on adoption, I definitely agree we can either try to get this early but the, the showing and discussion of operation expenditures, we really tried early last year and went through January. So I, I believe we managed to bring back early three months of budget discussions of operation expenditures to the mm -hmm. table. And I think we definitely can improve further. I, I, I think, you know, that's a great point that we, we really, I think council administration uh, starting last year in August, September, October, and. And then uh, we were nearly uh, locked in by December. 
Uh, the only thing that, that clunks, you, clunks you up a little bit is the whole assessment. assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Preview whole assessment role yeah. and, PRA, and the gaming. Uh, final assessment. Um, and then this year, obviously, in February, March, we got mm -hmm. uh, hammered with the COVID. But I think we did a very good job this year, to your point about getting it done earlier. I really believe that, that we were nowhere near in the same model as traditionally what we've done, where we're scrambling trying to get March and April, we're plugged with it, trying to get that uh, operational budget completed. So, mm -hmm. Councillor Parzal, then Councillor Javetka. Well, as Councillor Javetkov raised this matter, I mean, I, so I'm really pleased that we changed our timelines. Um, and I, I don't want to talk about this in the committee of the whole, but as Councillor Javetkov uh, stated, uh, I, so I'm really pleased that this, what's happened, and yes, you are definitely, we had if there was going to be any changes, you know, there's plenty of opportunities and we do have to make payments <laughs> to people's salaries and so on. I don't think that's really the point Councillor Javakov's getting at. Uh, as I understand it, but let me just uh, try and interpret what he's uh, saying, but I believe, especially more than ever with this uh, financial crisis that we are uh, all, all municipalities and all levels of government are facing, that um, we can refine e a little bit, um, bringing it forward just a bit more so that by the end of December 2020, Council can enact decisions it needs to make as it relates to any cuts of, in operating. <coughs> So we have the full pact of impact of them as savings for 2021. Not, well, we're going to implement them in, uh, let's say, June of, you know, and only get six months benefit. So that's that's what I'm, I think is, is necessary. And was, as the mayor said, you know, all of that is uh, withstanding the changes to assessment and, uh, uh, other externals, but I think it's well worth it. It empowers the system in its management, bringing <laughs> forward this budget uh, timeline. Okay, we're we're I allowed a little bit Sorry. of discretion here, but we're uh, we don't have a motion. We don't have a agenda item. We're gonna. <laughs> Do you have no, one more no. comment? Good. No. Good. Thank you. So uh, seven seven, we have report twenty oh eight by from the finance manager regarding our s statement of financial information. Councillor Move that report number 2085 from the finance manager read 2019 statement of financial information be received. Further, that council approve the city of Dawson Creek 2019 statement of financial information as presented. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl, discussion, comments, anyone? Councillor Parslow? Yes, some, some comments uh, ab about them. Um, we talked about utilities. I was, I've circled a number of things here in this report. Uh, I was uh, surprised that uh, we, uh, our hydro and power bill, it was uh, $1.458 million uh, for power. And um, I, I I understand that, but I just wanted to say, gee, that's a lot of money, and uh, we need to, I mean, the city does a good job, I think, in many regards, but uh, this discussion about utilities and some of the, our other buildings that we don't necessarily manage, uh, I think that this number gives us some context for that discussion. Um, there's one or two things here. Um, just can you refresh my memory? Brocourt Construction did two million two hundred thirty-six thousand. I'd lost track of what that was for. I mean, I know we the airport. What was that one for? The airport. The work we did with the uh, drainage. The Thank airport. you. That was that. A cap. Yeah. Yes. Funded by A cap. It, it, yes. Yeah. We received a grant under A cap. We received a grant. Yeah. Why would we send one hundred seventy-five thousand to QP? Oh, that's their um, pension. The the dues, their dues, monthly dues. Oh, yes, dues that that we collect. Thank you. Them. That's yeah. right. So it's mainly collected by the employers and paid for them. Right. 
Wright and a couple of others. No. What are we buying? Uh, is the, the North Peace Petroleum, Fort St. John, is that for our air, airport fuel that we buy? I was just wondering why we're spending a third of a million dollars in Fort St. John. And I, I seem then to have a recollection it was for airport fuel. North Peace Petroleum, that, that I... Aviation fuel? I think the aviation fuel. Aviation fuel. fuel. Yeah. And there's no local provider? I'm not, uh, sorry. not that I'm aware, but we would tender that as well. Yeah, that's true. And can three million eight hundred for PRRD MFA payments, Minister of Finance? Yes, yes. Municipal yes finance. so that's well, the that the debt payments exactly debt through payments. PRRD. Right. And we pay uh, one and a half million. I found that, I mean, I'm not against it at all. It just, these are things that stood out for me. We spend a one and a half million, um, we, it, to the Peace River Regional Hospital District, right? Uh, yeah, that's the recession. Yes. The recession. 40% of every major capital project or every capital project through uh, Northern Health through the Ministry of Health that go on, so the hospitals, the, any capital programs, then we as taxpayers in the region pay 40% of them, so when the new hospital is announced, the residents in the Northeast will pay 40% of that hospital, and it goes through the Peace River Regional Hospital District, which is a subset of the Regional Hospital Board, or the Regional District Board. Good. Of which we have, I'll just use as a, uh, 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 the PRRD has about 70 million in the bank for the Dawson Creek and District Hospital now. Which is ready for that, good. right? Yeah. Yeah, good. Good, thank you. Further discussion, comments? Blair? Your Worship, just for clarification, should the public be on there looking at it? Under the wages, there will be some numbers that are relatively high. There's an adjustment there uh, over the last two years based on vacation, bank vacation payout. One is uh, to deal with severance. So uh, I know if people were to read that and not have an explanation, they may conclude that that was what we paid per year. Uh, there are a couple in there that seem substantially higher than normal. That would be the reason why. I and that was a direction by council about three years ago where yeah. we changed that yes, policy for to senior exempt policy. and management staff to be able to bank vacation. And that now is being uh, paid out. And I don't think we have any employees left that have left any in that bank, do they? I believe we've looked after that now. Yeah. Thank you. Direction. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for, I think that's a very necessary clarification. In the same spirit, one of the uh, things that we will hear about is uh, relate to firefighters. Uh, Council has adopted uh, new procedures and policies. Um, I, I, I would like to I wonder if we council can receive some information about, in a sort of a quarterly basis, about how the those those um, policies are uh, being implemented. I.e., you know, the, what what is happening is some of the call out being reduced, etc. I think we need to to get some report because this is a the cost of protective services, necessary as they are, are a, a major problem for all municipalities that have professional police forces, professional firefighting forces. And we, we've adopted these policies, and I'd like to see if we can get, if how they, I know you're monitoring them, but uh, what impact are they having? I th through your worship, I think we can provide that. Uh, I can give you a uh, a preliminary update with the changes that council worked on with our fire department and the uh, reduction in the overtime for instance we have been achieving that uh, I don't have the exact number in front of me but I have been in discussions with them uh, the work that council done and the direction they gave to administration has worked well to date we will uh, work to bring forward a report as councillor Parslow has uh, asked to show uh, how those cost savings are starting to to work for us there without question there is far less overtime being dealt with today in the fire hall than there was a year ago uh, from today so but we will do that stuff thank you 
Um, further comments? All in favor of receiving the report? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. So we'll take a five minute, six minute break and um, reconvene at 10.30 ish. Back into our uh, agenda and um, our next item is item 7.4. We have report 2086 from the general manager of development services regarding a quotation request for quotations for the 17th Street multi-use retaining wall. Councillor Javekov. Move the report number 20-086 from the General Manager of Development Services. Re-request for quotations 2020-22, 17th Street, multi-use path retaining wall be received. Further, that Council award RFQ 2020-22 to Smith Conley Services Limited for the contract price of $29,715 plus applicable taxes. Thank you. Second? Councillor uh, Earl, discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried, thank you. And 7.9, we have report number 2087 from the Water Resource Manager regarding request for quotations for the water treatment plant access road project. Councillor Earl? Uh, I'll move the recommendation that report number 20-087 from the Water Resource Manager regarding request for quotation 2020-16 Water Treatment Plant Access Road Project summary be received. Further, that Council award RFQ 2020-16 Water Treatment Plant Road Upgrades to Dave Moore Trucking Limited for the contract price of $313,064.84, including tax. Thank you. Second? Councillor Parzal, discussion? All, Councillor Javekov? <clears throat> Just confirmation, This all of this work is actually on the city part of the road because the highways is responsible for the bulk of the access going in there, right? Eh? I'll have to go to camera for that. Yeah, so through your worship, uh, correct, it's all on site. Um, this, when we say water treatment plant road, it's, it's an internal road network around the plant itself. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. 710, we have report number 20088 from the finance manager regarding request for proposals 2018 for cell phone hardware and services. Councillor Parzal. Report 20088 from the finance manager. We request for proposal 2020-18. Cellular phone hardware and services be received. Further, the staff be directed to enter, to enter into a three-year agreement with TELUS for cellular services commencing June the 29th, 2020. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl, discussion? Larry, you have any comments on... No, Your Worship. This is one we go out... Um, and the proposal came back. There is some significant savings, although it's broke down in different manners. You can see through the report, but it's uh, pretty straightforward. This one, your worship. Mm -hmm. Thank can you. I just say this something? Go, go ahead, yeah, I just learned on Friday. So to oh. be able to get uh, this, uh, the deal of the discount uh, with uh, Telus, also landline. So the contract will be signed three years for cellular and landline. So we are able to recover 114,000. So in savings oh. for three years. Good stuff. Thank you. I was I, when I read the report, and I just mentioned to Blair uh, last week about uh, you know when I sit at the regional district table and uh, see some of these contracts that we award the city do, and I guarantee Fort St. John, City of Fort St. John, are similar in the PRRD. And it hit me when we were doing uh, some of the stuff with solid waste, and uh, I think the company GFL, I think, is the company that got our waste contract, also got a contract with. The regional district, and to me, I uh, I think it's a topic that Blair and I uh, really need to engage with Sean and the RD and the City of Fort St. John because I guarantee the City of Fort St. John are doing this, and the Peachtree Regional District for cell, for IT, for solid waste, for vehicles, for paving, and maybe there's an opportunity for us to bring this uh, scale of projects and the scale of bidding into picture if we could find some consistency in how we put those together to have the three major, uh, uh, two major municipalities along with uh, RD to look at this uh, as an opportunity for the future, um, try to leverage uh, the bidding and even get it more competitive. Anyway, just a side thought. 
Well, we, as the capital city of the peace, we could do that for everything. Partner with the energy city of the north, and <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> no. We're the capital city. <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Flavian Blair. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. 711, uh, this is the follow up to the motion we made, it's, uh, report number 2089 from the CFO regarding the waiving of the late penalty and utility fees and charges. Councillor Javakov? I move that report number 20 089 from the Chief Financial Officer re waiving late payment penalty for utility fees and charges extension be received. Further, that Council directs staff to waive the 10% late penalty within the following bylaws effective immediately through to August 31st, 2020. Water rates and regulations bylaw number 4087, sewer rates and regulations bylaw 4088, and solid waste and recyclable material regulation bylaw 4380. Thank you. Second, Councillor Earl. And this was because we had uh, the original motion, we did it till the end of May. And uh, when council did this uh, waiving of the late penalty fee, so this extends it now to the end of August. Blair? It also brings it in line with the uh, tax uh, okay. of the 2% that council Good. agreed to last. Sure. Good. Thank you. Further comments? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Uh, item 8 bylaws. We have uh, 8.1, the appointment of officers bylaw. 2020 for consideration of adoption. Councillor Parzal. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. 8.2, we have report number 2081 from the Chief Financial Officer regarding a convenience fee for credit card payments, fees and charges amendment bylaw number 4448-2020. Councillor Parzal. Recommendation one, that report number 2081 from the CFO, agree convenience fees on credit card payments be received. Further, council direct staff to implement a 2% convenience fee on credit card payment transactions starting May the 25th, 2020. Recommendation, do you want them separate? Can we do them all at once, Brendan? Or would you? Our, oh no, we should do them separate because yeah. we're getting first yeah. three readings and then yeah. adopting. So yeah. yeah, that's so we'll do first motion recommendation to have a seconder, Councillor Javekov. Discussion. Bobby, do you want to give a little overview of what this we're proposing? Yeah. So so mainly uh, we've been receiving credit card in a couple of years uh, for utility bills and other services, uh, and we are charged by the credit card company an average of can be from 0.75 to 2.5 percent depending on the card that the person is paying uh, and it's bearing the cost to us uh, so but we never use it for property tax so considering now the the current conditions uh, what's happening uh, we would like to actually start to process it, payments for property tax with um, credit card but also be able to charge it with just uh, transferring the fees that it's um, charged by the credit card companies to the ones that are conveniently used for their own purpose, the credit card. So. Thank you. So it's basically the fee we get charged by the credit card company it's that we're a, wanting to add into ensure we don't lose 2% off of the cost of the, the cost of revenue, exactly. Uh, so just as further information, um, those of us who pay our property taxes at the provincial government, we are unable to use credit card for yeah. that reason. We has to be uh, debit. No. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, yeah. Thank you. Ready for the question? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. And recommendation two? The fees and charges amendment by law number 4448-2020 be given first three readings. Thank you. Second? Councillor Earl? Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And uh, recommendation number three? Fees and charges amendment bylaw number 448 2020 be adopted. Thank you. Second. Councillor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, everybody. Uh, item 9 is Mayor's Business and first one, uh, Council Meeting Space. And so, this um, aspect of uh, being able to facilitate a meeting uh, in this room uh, with and if we had all council members here and staff, it you just obviously physically it's 
very difficult to accommodate personal spacing. Blair and I were talking about it. I don't see that this is going to change for a period of time. It's really, really difficult for any of us that have phoned in to effectively participate in the meetings sometimes on that telephone um, as if you're here. And so we talked about maybe is there some uh, options or alternatives and you know I saw we're having the same thing at the Peachtree Regional District where they got 12 um, board members as well as staff and so um, we had Blair and I had a little bit of discussion about this in terms of is there a way for us to maybe find a, a location that would have been conducive to being able to for us to have our meetings a larger space as well as for them and then set it up so that technology allows us to do that but Blair's talked to and I'll let you Blair speak to your discussion well thank you worship I have reached out to Sean at the regional district they are go now going to accommodate their meetings they believe within their boardroom they can uh, realign what needs to be set there so that once they receive uh, a full uh, grouping of the directors in there they can meet their social distancing and so on so originally we thought that there may be a possibility if they were looking at somewhere to host these that we would do it together in a combined effort uh, that it seems to have changed somewhat we have looked at this room um, it is a, a tight quarters to accomplish the social distancing but I think it can be done based on our staff coming and going as needed through council or committee of the whole reports and so on uh, there is the option should council wish to consider renovations to this uh, that can be looked at whether that would be accomplished in the short term or not is the whole other uh, decision making matrix we would have to look at but or we could look outside um, of this facility and go somewhere else to host our council meetings now we are set up here with the audio uh, equipment and so on but it is a discussion the mayor and I have had um, I do think in speaking with Brenda and we've looked at the facility here with some realignment uh, we think it's possible to have a full contingent of council um, anytime you're in tight quarters even if you can maintain your six foot distancing the key is upon movement around we, we have to do our best I think most people would probably venture to say that uh, as well as everybody has tried you run into occasion where you're inside that six foot uh, area it's just uh, part of the situation we're in but overall I can tell you the people at City Hall have been working hard at it I believe our outside crews as well but um, we're going to have to consider that the public delegation is going to be a challenge your worship uh, we had a delegation this morning uh, come in I think if it was single presenters we may be able to accomplish that in a limited capacity um, but the world is a different place today for our meeting and I honestly I really like the idea of us if um, well, f first of all, I, like I say, I really want to find a way, uh, the infrastructure to be able to accommodate all of council being here in person if they choose. And two, I, I really like the idea of if the, we could strike a deal with the regional district to be able to utilize that boardroom yeah. because it's much, much larger because it accommodates 12 uh, directors. We could easily do it. They, own, they meet on Thursdays. So if we could strike a deal with them. We just got to then get the technology for our recording for New Harvest and the media and all of that and staff. But it, it would be, I think, uh, allow the accommodation of in-person as well as delegations as well. Councillor Parslow and then Councillor Director. Well, I like that idea for sure. Um, when you talk about accommodation within this facility, were you referencing a, a full council? or the sits member interim council we have a full council yeah. we've um and i will provide an update shortly uh, based yeah. on the by-election issue we've well i i prefer the regional district because uh i, I imagine that uh, not only could it more easily accommodate it, it might even be able to accommodate some people attending yeah absolutely it's much 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 bigger room and uh, like i say i just uh, it, obviously it's got some clunkiness to it that's not as clean as this but it uh, my, my my bigger concern is I think this is going to go on for a while I don't see the social distancing issue moving away quickly at all in terms of 2020 the way you talk and so we should be finding a solution so that our council can be here in person and engage in person as well as then having our staff available as well Councilor Jebeko yeah I, I prefer this uh, venue I mean if it's possible we can accommodate the, the whole council in here um, 
you know, as a second choice. I mean, the regional district would be the obvious one, but um, <clears throat> if we can accommodate it here, why not? We don't, everything is set up here. Yeah. And I don't know how long this is going to go on, but uh, I think in the next, you know, month or two months, we will get a better idea of how long it's going to be going on for. So uh, I think it's going to be for short term, personally, but. I, I guess just the uh, the uh, six the, the six foot we can accommodate six council here. Uh, then it just how we get our administration yeah. in the in the room. Then we got to do some work around. So if you, if you would like, your worship, I can uh, enter some discussions with uh, the Peace River Regional District to see if that's an option that we could, as well as present an option for this room, and then council could make a determination. <laughs> go forward I, I for me it's more I want to make sure we have the ability for all of council to be in here and participate <laughs> okay so we'll follow that up Would, do you want do we need a motion to do that do I don't think so I've heard the direction here your worship I will uh, pull something together and have a report for you at the next meeting thank you we've been engaging on a by every week now the northern British Columbia Chamber of Commerce has set up a meeting uh, for all of the Northern Chambers, as well as the mayors, the MLAs, the MPs. Uh, I've been participating in it the last two uh, weeks, and uh, <clears throat> it's really about how uh, business are, uh, and the chambers are helping to recover the local business, the local economy for them, and what some of the steps and interactions have been very interesting to hear the discussion going on from all of the communities across the north. Uh, and that's all the way from, I would say, Quinell, uh, Hunter Mile, up to uh, the Northern Rockies and it's out to the west and McBride's been very uh, engaging and really worthwhile and hearing the MPs, Todd Doherty and um, the MLAs engaging, it's just been very worthwhile and have really appreciated the opportunity and they're talking about common issues and but I think the common, really the common thread has been about how do we engage our local community, how do we engage our local economy and our local business and, how, and stepping up uh, initiatives that can help do that. So. Anyway, I'll uh, continue to bring council updates on those meetings as they occur, and um, I'm involved in them. <clears throat> Item 9.2 it uh, arose at our last uh, PRRD meeting, and um, <clears throat> it deals with the uh, Caribou recovery uh, and the partnership agreement with Caribou, and obviously all through 2019 we dealt with the Caribou initiative. Uh, Blair was involved in it uh, significantly <clears throat> and as it became evident that the province and the federal government um, and the uh, partnership agreement they were moving forward with with West Moberly and Soto was being agreed to and they weren't going to relent and put the communities um, and local government into that partnership agreement as signatories to it as components of it um, <clears throat> and it was moving forward. <coughs> Chetwind had said they weren't going to participate in the RD through their representative director, Vice Chair Rose, <coughs> and um, ourselves said we weren't going to participate and we pulled out from that, uh, sitting on those various committees, <coughs> the Snowmobile Recovery Backcountry Committee, the Snowmobile uh, Committee, Socioeconomic and the Caribou Recovery Planning. So it has now, Chetwin is, uh, is now participating in the committees. Um, the North Peace municipalities along with Tumblr Ridge are participating in the committees. Now the board have dealt, PRD have dealt with it and are going to <coughs> direct the uh, vice chair and chair to participate in those committees. <coughs> and so we as a community are the only now local government who are not participating <coughs> as a result of that um, position we took. Uh, three or four months ago in January by saying we weren't going to participate as long as we were left out of the partnership agreement. And so when it come back to the board that the chair and the vice chair at the RD now have been directed they can uh, participate. <coughs> I wasn't aware Chetwin had moved back into the participation so I felt it was appropriate that council uh, reconsider and review it now that we have this new direction. Blair, you have anything you want to? Um, I think you've covered it, Your Worship. I think one of the key uh, issues in the determining factor that the city of Dawson Creek made was their support for our community and neighbor uh, Chetwind. Uh, the impact is they're the epicenter of this, uh, the potential impact that could occur. 
uh, when they were prepared to not attend and not participate because um, the government was prepared to sign this agreement without any input from the local governments, that's when this council made the determination that we were going to support our neighbour. Uh, and as the mayor has said, apparently Chetwind has now gone back into the fold um, to participate in this, uh, even though it's signed today. And now Dawson Creek is the lone man standing, uh, which is somewhat of a surprise uh, situation we find ourselves in. Um, <coughs> so if we want uh, to be part of it. The council has directed me not to be part of it, so I think we need to either, um, with this new information, either ratify that and, and say we're going to maintain that position or redirect and allow us to participate in the committee. Councillor Jovekla. So <coughs> what is the purpose of the committee if the <coughs> decision has already been made the agreement is already in place and we've got a significant amount of land that's excluded now from uh, resource use what what is the purpose of the committee now yeah the three committees that they've got structured are meeting to provide input into um, the partnership agreement and then the decisions will be made by and the parties in the partnership agreement but the committees are providing input into it in my understanding but we have not been involved in it so so chronologically, uh, did Chetwin rejoin before the PRRD appointed the chair and vice chair? Yeah, the, bar, uh, the RD just, uh, just at our last meeting or the meeting that. prior to that where they've appointed and directed. Right. Um, and so I think everybody's now of the view because local government have been participating, some members of local government have been participating saying, look, you're, you're, now, you're either going to be on the outside not providing any input or uh, you're not going to be you're going to be providing some input, but it's still a partnership agreement and the structure around that where the decisions are made. And did Tumbler Ridge join after or along no? With Tumbler Ridge John? and Fort St. John and Taylor All and stayed in. then the McKenzie they stayed in right away and wanted to be part of those committees. Councillor Earl and Councillor Dracon. Uh Thank you, Your Worship. And certainly, it seems like <coughs> the utility of taking a principled stand based on the fact that the uh, provincial government and the federal government didn't include municipalities in the discussion or add them as signatories is perhaps run its course. I have to admit I'm a little dismayed at the by how this has been handled by our neighboring community in Chetwin. I, I'm not sure what the rationale for uh, not communicating to the other body, you know, we as a city, as as Blair mentioned, we're not the epicenter of this. We're, I mean, uh, uh, there might be some backcountry users that live in Dawson Creek that are going to be affected, but for the most part, uh, our decision was a pr one a principle and in an issue of solidarity with Chetwind. So uh, I, I mean, I'm willing to enter discussions provided and I'll rely on you if you're uh, representing us there to let us know if you think they're fruitful discussions that are worth our time or whether we're just there as a symbolic gesture to inclusion but uh, I, I would like to make note of, of how I guess haphazard this approach has been from Chetwin to not at least as a professional courtesy give us a heads up of what their intentions were because we did I and mean, we could have done what the North Peace did because it wouldn't have cost us anything and we would have stayed in the provincial government's good books for lack of a better term uh, we publicly and openly uh, renounced the process and the agreement uh, in part as a show of solidarity to them so to them find out after the fact that they've been participating in the discussions the whole time is not a something like I said I, I'm somewhat dismayed by that I guess is how uh, diplomatically I'll phrase that okay, Councillor Jureka. yeah I guess generally uh, it's good to have input on on everything if it's going to if there's even a hope that uh, input will be considered but it's already proven that it hasn't been considered so I don't like I mean if we want to have input into what Chetwin does with the uh, you know 
the employees of a mill if the mill is shut down because they can't access uh, their resource um, you know that's a challenge issue I don't know I you know the recreation I think will continue in that area but it's the resource activity the industry that's going to be excluded so if it's excluded it's excluded what more input is there well I think the uh, backing it up it's the partnership agreement as soon as the partnership agreement the province of heads and that partnership agreement was signed everybody then is of the same right you're either on the outside not given anything but the partnership agreement is moving forward so, so our council uh, do you want to maintain um, our position or do you feel there's some value in us participating I now believe that we can't be the only community on the outside I think we need to be now participating in them to at least provide that input uh, on behalf of our community and we have LP Louisiana Pacific that uh, has uh, um, potential impacts to the quintet zone so Councillor Jebecca you know if you're willing to <laughs> to participate uh, I don't think it's going to hurt us to no. partic participate and at least we will get some information on anything if anything positive comes up but uh, like I say I mean what do you have an input into but yeah. it's uh, it's not costing us much yeah. to, for you to have uh, involvement it's backcountry access socioeconomic and all of that stuff that I is, is moving forward and um, I believe now um, they are moving forward and we're the only ones on not participating in a local government perspective so do you need a yeah motion? we do because we've directed right. council directed us to not participate so. so we need to rescind that motion or I think we need to have a new new direction today based on this new information yeah, I'll make a motion that we get involved thank you second council Earl any further discussion all in favor opposed carry thank you it reminds me of the uh, discussion we had when uh, we were the only one not joining the uh, call-in oh, resource Goodness. municipalities coalition. Oh, yeah. I said, "Well, we can't be the outside." I said, "No, it's just growing bureaucracy." And six months later, you came on board as mayor and advised we leave it. <laughs> well, the uh, great part about democracy is you get to make choices. <laughs> yes, I, and sometimes they're the wrong ones. <laughs> um, so now we're going to add a new item here onto our agenda and I've got a regular feature <laughs> yeah we got a couple of more uh, items behind that are going to come as a result of delegations but 9.3 I wanted to uh, Blair and I talked about this and just give the CAO an opportunity to give some operational updates so um, Blair Thank you. Good all right yeah, well written um, report, Blair. on occasion there is a requirement for written reports without question <laughs> but there's many times between our meetings that whether counselors raise questions issues are brought forward that there would it would be appropriate during the council meeting to have time to give that update so um, we'll begin with this today one of the things we've been working on the City Hall reopening uh, people have been asking when will City Hall be reopening we are in the process of having uh, glass I believe we have secured a provider as of late Friday uh, to put up the barriers for our facilities starting with our finance department downstairs and engineering uh, we will then see the counter up here as well as down in uh, parks and recreation uh, and as we learn more about the opening of the pool for example there will be a plexiglass barrier put at that counter so it is our hope that uh, no later than by the end of this month uh, we would have those installed we will open as soon as we have the barriers installed for the protection of the public and the staff um, and that will be well ahead of tax time we are sending out the tax notice I believe by week's end uh, is our plan um, so that's ongoing many people have asked that question of myself and I'm sure others have been asked as well I was asked to reach out to the Mile Zero campground following a letter we received as well from uh, a business in town uh, wondering about the possibility of the campground not being open this year so it wouldn't compete with others. Uh, I reached out to them, had a good discussion uh, with Dale Campbell about it. Uh, it became very evident that as little um, as they expect 
uh, as far as reservations or occupancy this year, it is still their only ability to raise revenue to reinvest in the village. Uh, so they indicated that they would be running, but they are certainly at a far reduced capacity as well. I believe their facilities are not opened, so it will be self-sustaining uh, campers that will be there. There will be no washroom facilities opened uh, or the laundry facilities. So that is where that is at. The issue of the by-election, I've been asked by a number of councillors as well as the public when that will take place. I know Brenda, uh, I have been on a call with the government as well. The government is well aware we're not the only community uh, looking to hold a by-election. They are working on it. We're hoping to hear something very soon uh, as far as our ability to host it. They're quite confident that it will happen in the very near future. Uh, it may look a little different than previous elections or by-elections, possibly over multiple days. They're entertaining possibly different facilities where we'll attend. Uh, but as soon as we have that information, I will provide an update to uh, Mayor and Council on that. Brenda, have you heard anything as of late Friday? That was the latest update I had on the by-election. No, nothing since that. All right. And those are the, the three issues I wanted to touch on this morning, Your Worship, and I appreciate you. you giving me the time. Sure. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Council Director? So <clears throat> there was a conference call on May 20th, and in that conference call they mentioned that uh, it was okay to open up playgrounds. Yes. We are, playgrounds were never closed. It was discussion and discretion of each municipality and school district and so on to do that. Uh, we made the determination to close ours with the information that we were given based on the transmission of the virus. Uh, we are in the process of having that discussion about reopening uh, our playgrounds with signage uh, so that people are aware that there is uh, a pandemic going on out there but we're also reaching out to the school district i think it would be incumbent that if we make a decision that we try and make it somewhat equitable so we don't have a city playground open and a, a school playground closed they're all similar in nature so both ross and i have had that discussion and we're expecting to uh have additional information this week on that so but thank you um anything further so we had two items uh, to deal with under our um, delegations today, and we had uh, Don Reedman call in requesting that council consider either a lower purchase price or giving them the property. Um, and council, through our previous direction on this and how we were handling it, was a uh, policy, or a direction in terms of how we're going to handle the sale of the properties, etc. So we need to, if we're going to consider. Uh, his request, we need a special uh, motion to direct. Councillor Parzal? Well, <coughs> one of the, his assertions was around those large trees um, being an impediment for him to construct a fence. I'm strong belief you know if you do it for one you better be prepared to do it for everyone so my instinct is to say no however if there is a, a serious impediment I think we need to take that into consideration um, I don't know how right? so, so as a general principle I, I would say absolutely no variance but if there is impediment then we need to apply some common sense to it okay so perhaps a, maybe a motion to direct administration to have uh, our staff go out and inspect the property based on the survey to ensure that if there is a a trees or something that's going to in interfere with its ability to uh, construct <coughs> a fence on the property line that we bring that ba information back on what options or alternatives we could pursue so Claire? we could do that your worship i think that um determining uh, if they're in the park then park trees are city property yeah. um it, you may we will definitely do that you may run into a situation where there may be other areas where somebody's backed onto a park and if there's a tree root giving them problem i don't not sure the intent of this motion is going to be that we start cutting down all the trees that are putting roots into people's pathway to put a a fence up yeah no for me it was just more about the issue of if he can't build a fence mm -hmm. on the existing property line because those big trees are there now then do we have to m alter the survey for the property line 
to allow him to accommodate the new fence. Maybe I'll just reach over to Brenda. Brenda, do we not have those property line drawings already and was that not looked at or is this something that we just haven't pinpointed down with those trees? There was a survey done. We do have the property lines identified. Um, we did provide an estimated amount of land that would encompass each encroachment um, and I guess my question. Died, I can't it, answer the yeah. question if they are about on the, the roots of we the trees. Will okay. So maybe we can direct administration to go and have a look at the mm -hmm. property for those impediments. If he can't build the fence on the existing prop on the what is his property today, um, then what do we need to do to it? If he's not interested in purchasing the property, mm -hmm. okay. right? Uh Yeah, just to reiterate, based on the the um, call we had from Mr. Reedman, he seemed to be uncertain as to whether it was 15 or 20 feet because his pegs had disappeared or, or something to that effect and he couldn't find them. So it might be worth just having staff go and, and help him ascertain what exactly he's got there. Um, <coughs> and just one last piece with respect to the, uh, just a, a comment I probably should have mentioned at the time, but your worship, you mentioned it as well, the uh, bid for the uh, I guess land management negotiation that went to an out-of-town company. Uh, it, this is taxpayer money. We've got a bid process in place and that was the low bid uh, for those who'd like us to score it in such a way as to uh, privilege local companies. Uh, the issue we run into there and I think uh, our CAO, when he was a, a, he mentioned when he was a mayor, he got some pushback on this because he wanted to explore that option. Is once we start doing that, surrounding municipalities and government bo governing bodies do the same thing, and that inhibits our local contractors' ability to seek work outside the city. So, uh, as well intentioned as it is, that is uh, in part anyway the rationale for why we wouldn't do something like that. So, uh, if we can have a motion to direct administration, Councillor Parsley, got the, uh, you're okay I'm, for I'm fine with that, I understand you better. Second? Councillor Javekoff? Councillor Earl, you had a question? Nope, I was going to okay. second there, sorry. Councillor Javekoff? So, I just <clears throat> had a question on how, how far we've advanced on this whole plan. We've been working on it now for about four years. Um, have we actually sold some property as some of the <laughs> issues uh, resolved yeah. or Brenda? is the whole thing still uh, where it was at a year ago? Yeah. Brenda? Um, I had intended on speaking to that in the committee of the whole. Um, okay. We have, you want to wait to that or I can Good. answer it now? No, we can, we'll, do, we'll deal with it under committee of the whole. Yeah. You got it in there? Great. All, right. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, nine po I'm going to add, uh, we also had another request and it dealt with uh, item 6.1, the letter from the Alliance of Beverage Licenses and in terms of us uh, doing that and so if we can maybe, uh, what we need to do is then uh, get administration to, uh, direct administration to bring back a report or a policy regarding temporary patio uh, approvals and Brenda give me kind of that and then staff can develop the policy, the parameters, the cost, the hours, the lease areas and delegate the staff to enter into that uh, ability to do that on a temporary basis. Councillor Parzal. So we're directing staff to bring back a report, a policy regarding temporary patio approvals. Second? Councillor Earl? Discussion? All in favor? Uh, Sorry, Councillor Earl, you had a question? Just, oh, uh, just, Your Worship, I think we've done some preliminary work on this, Brenda, uh, based on it wouldn't be a lease and there are ways to, to do this. Um, if you need a full report or I think we could probably deal with it fairly quickly should anybody request but Brenda do you have anything to add we've we've looked at this already on behalf of the city so yeah through your worship a license to occupy would be the document that we'd use for it but the policy just would set certain parameters that would allow staff to enter into the license of occupation without coming back to council every time Okay. So it just would speed up the process if we have all the parameters set that's approved by council first and then staff can carry right. on with that. So Otherwise each one have to come back to council for approval, right? right. We don't want that. We'll we don't want that, that for, for you guys either, right? So. All in favor? 
Opposed carry. And I'm going to add one other one because it popped up on me on Thursday and it was uh, Emergency Management BC. And I had a call with the Deputy Minister on Thursday afternoon in regards to the flood mitigation report that Council received about two weeks ago. So I scheduled a call with the Deputy Minister to talk about that work we're doing and some of the aspects around uh, the infrastructure work around 102nd, 17th, the overall planning of that reservoir. And so the Deputy was obviously. Um, very pleased with the planning work and the steps that council have taken and she's directed now her staff were on the call with me and they're going to be working with Blair now to expedite hopefully funding options that might be available for that infrastructure both for 102nd as well as for the reservoir and to be able to move that forward and the different not only funding for shovel ready projects but there's also other uh, stuff that's available so they'll work with administration to identify that process and bring that back to council for moving it forward. Blair? Your Worship, just a quick follow-up. Uh, Friday afternoon, they did reach out already. We began those discussions. I know that Kevin will be in uh, discussions again early this week. Uh, there may be a real possibility there and they seem very excited about uh, some of the options that we proposed already. So. Yeah, it was very, very engaging. I was really, really pleased with the response we got from the deputy. And and so hopefully that might ex expedite uh, some work this year for a whole bunch of very beneficial uh, aspects to our infrastructure and flood mitigation and all that stuff. That's it for me. So um, diary, anything? Nothing to report from the diary. Uh, consent calendar, we have a couple of items of letters. Motion for uh, to approve the consent. Councillor Earl, second. Councillor Javekov. Uh, you want to lift anything from the consent? Anybody? All in favor? Opposed? Carry. You wait for your glasses at a real opportune <laughs> time. <laughs> <laughs> Strategic priorities. <laughs> uh, nothing to report new on those, Your Worship. Thank you. Media? <laughs> nope. Uh, so we'll move to Committee of the Whole reports and uh, Staff Sergeant Laurel Damon's here this morning. And I thought uh, we haven't seen, uh, obviously with this new world, we haven't seen our some of our department heads, and I really thought it appropriate we invite Damon in this morning to have a little bit of an update. And we certainly, it's much uh, more informative sometimes to have the discussion and the interaction, Damon. So we appreciate you coming in this morning, and it's good to have you here. Thank you for having me, Your Worship, and Councilors. Thank you. It's good to see you. I don't think I've been here since February, so <laughs> no. it's been some time for sure. So. I'll start with the policing report. So my report today will cover uh, the period of April 2020. Uh, at present, we have five soft vacancies or member soft vacancies or positions that are filled. The officers aren't presently able to report for work, so they're temporarily off duty. We have no hard vacancies. We're actually surplus to establishment by two positions right now, so we have two extra members here. Uh, that's a result of pre-planning for outgoing transfers. So we're trying to avoid having hard vacancies. We're getting members in before the other ones go out. For our annual policing plan priorities, or our strategic priorities, what you call them, uh, we have identified four policing priorities. Those were selected as a result of community consultations. We have identified our year-end targets, and we're just in the process right now of identifying the initiatives that will help us reach those targets. So I expect to have that done by this week, so I'll be able to report on that on your next report on kind of lay out the whole priority plan for the year. Our policing priorities for the year, in no particular order, uh, the first one was organized crime re and, and, and focusing on repeat and chronic offenders. You'll remember that 90% of our crimes committed by 10 people in town type things. So if we really focus on these people, we'll have the biggest uh, 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 success in, in lowering our crime levels here in Dawson Creek in the area. The objective that we set for that was to identify, target, monitor, and address a minimum of 10 repeat and chronic offenders in the Dawson Creek area before March 31st, 2021. Again, we operate on the fiscal calendar. The second policing priority, uh, the objective, the target, or pardon me, the second policing priority was uh, property theft. Again, it continues to be the largest uh, uh, area of crime in Doss Creek area. The objective, the target that we set was to reduce theft under $5,000 in Doss Creek area by 10% before March 30th, 2021. So last year we had property crime as a uh, policing priority and we focused on vehicle thefts. So at the end of the year, uh, after the year we worked on it, we ended up decreasing vehicle theft in our area by 23%, give or take. I can't remember exactly what it was. 
So this year, instead of focusing on vehicle theft, we're gonna focus a little bit more on theft under $5,000. So shoplifting, the thefts from vehicles, the, the, the stuff that's getting taken out of vehicles during night from unsecured vehicles, that kind of stuff. We're gonna focus a little bit more on that and see if we can have some positive effect on that. The third policing priority that we set was substance abuse, uh, focusing on drugs. Uh, that was loud and clear from the community. They wanted us to focus on drugs in the Dawson Creek area. The objective or the target that we set was to identify, target, monitor, and address a minimum of 10 drug houses. That's what people like to call them, or buildings that are being used to sell illicit drugs in the Dawson Creek area before March 30th, 2021. So again, loud and clear from our community consultations that we conducted was they really wanted us to focus, the community really wants us to focus on drug houses and the, the residences that are being used to sell illicit drugs. So we're gonna focus on those. And then the fourth policing priority that we established this year was to uh, work on and improve our police community relations and police visibility within the Dawson Creek area. The objective of the target that we set was to participate in or create police visibility in a minimum of 15 community policing events or primary community events within Dawson Creek before March 30th, 2021. We're already pretty involved, I think, in a lot of community activities, but perhaps we aren't tracking it very well or reporting on it very well. So this will give us a little bit better method of tracking it and reporting it back to the community and what we're actually doing in the community of Dawson Creek and the surrounding area. The crime trends this year, year to date, so January 1st to April 30th of 2020, we've had a total of 2,486 calls for service. That's down 14% compared to the same time last year. So January to April uh, 2019, our calls are down 14% this year. Of those calls, 78% were within the city and 22% were within the rural area. And that's pretty static. It doesn't really change at all. When we compare our calls to last year, calls within the city of Dawson Creek are down by 14% and within the rural area by 15%. For April of 2020, we did see some slight increases in thefts of vehicle and thefts from vehicle compared to April 2019. Uh, but we're dealing with relatively small numbers there. So uh, we had five last April in 2019, whereas we had nine this year. So the increase looks big, but it's not really that many more. It's not really something that I'm worried about right now, unless I continue to see over the next couple months it continuing to climb, and then we'll have to address it. We did see a 42% increase in calls for service relating to possession of drugs or drug trafficking. I contribute that to an increase of proactive enforcement by the detachments. So we have more officers on the road right now. More officers on the road means more interactions with criminals, more vehicles being stopped, etc. And we're, we're, we're uh, getting, as a result of those interactions, as a result of more officers on the road, we're getting more drugs off the road. Just in the last month, we've actually executed four search warrants relating to drug trafficking within the city of Dawson Creek. All other areas of crime saw decreases this month compared to 2019. So just in closing, as I mentioned, we're gonna be polishing up the annual priority plan and getting our initiatives in place to meet the identi identified target or objective that I informed you. And I'll report on that in my next report to you on June 22nd. Presently, we are continuing to suspend non-essential front counter service as we continue through the COVID-19 pandemic. So that means fingerprints, criminal record check right now are continue to be suspended. That said, we are currently evaluating how and when we can begin to offer those services again. And I do anticipate that some of those services will be offered again in limited capacity. It's keeping in mind that one of the services that we offer is fingerprints that requires physical contact and face-to-face -face contact. So there's some precautions there that we have to have in place before we can start to offer those services again. So we are uh, working through that and trying to determine how we're gonna be able to offer that and make sure that our staff is protected. Pending any question, that completes my report. Thank you, Damon. So questions, Council. Council Earl. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, I just first want to note my appreciation for the uh, diligence you paid uh, around the uh, vacancies, the hard vacancies, and being proactive about making sure we're not falling below uh, what our preferred allotment is or what our mandated allotment is or some combination thereof. Um, so a couple questions um, just around over the last couple months, obviously, how alcohol being a a significant driver or contributor to various types of criminal activity with the 
changes that have taken place in our community and across all communities over the last couple months around establishments being shut down has this altered the nature of how these issues are, are manifesting are they manifesting to the same extent and just uh, as you maybe caught the tail end of, we're looking at a policy which is going to expedite uh, some liquor serving venues in town, or I guess uh, licensed venues in town, to uh, allow them to open up faster and be more uh, increased capacity and what have you. And we've got a couple letters here from various, I guess the term would be lob lobby groups, advocacy groups around. Uh, alcohol services do you take a position on that have you have you had a chance to look over that at this point or do you have any thoughts on the matter I knew this question was going to come up really <laughs> no. uh, it's very difficult for me to to provide you any answer without guessing as mm -hmm. to if COVID has uh, uh, changed how what kind of calls we're getting or or uh, if it's affected our calls for service a year from now, I might be able to look back and say, uh, during April, May, June of last year, we did definitely see it arise. Mm -hmm. Right now, I can't. Uh, what I can tell you is that working in the office every day, frontline, hearing all the calls that come in, I haven't noticed, you know, any any difference in the last couple of months with more calls relating to alcohol abuse or substance abuse than mm -hmm. normal pre-COVID. What about um, domestic? Uh, same thing? Yeah, okay. same answer. So yeah, again, go back to my policing report just as an example. Uh, impaired driving for the, for the month of April 2020 compared to April 2019, we saw a decrease of 73%. Mm -hmm. So we only had 10 calls uh, for service relating to impaired driving, whereas this time last year we had 37. Uh, uh, so, I, I mean... People I mean, are drinking at home. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, <laughs> yeah, maybe they're not uh, driving. Potentially, yeah. Um, so I can't, there's been no noticeable change. I can tell you that in 2019, our crime was trending down, our calls for service are trending down, and we're continuing that trend in 2020. Uh, one last one really quickly, Your Worship. Looks like you got a haircut person. Where are you, where are you getting wife. the good stuff? Okay, My wife. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Just Thank curious. You. As you can tell, it's... Uh, for the Councillor Parswell? The cost is high, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in these four objectives. Uh, I know where they came from. It's a fair capture of the input you, you got. I have no... So I looked at the first one and, I, and you know I always think it's best to have something, these objectives uh, with hard work uh, you get a sound of better than 50 percent chance of achieving them, right? And this first one deals with uh, chronic offenders and it says, uh, identify, target, monitor, and address. And the, the an address is what I'm emphasizing. A minimum of 10 repeat chronic offenders. So uh, are you saying that you're going to be able to uh, eliminate this problem? Because <laughs> um, chronic offenders are chronic offenders. So can you, I, I'm sure when you work out the initiatives for this, you'll, you'll capture it, but I'm, I'm having problems with that address because I've always thought chronic offenders are what they are, chronic offenders. So the answer you put them away and then they come out again and continue. You're, you're right. I, I wasn't able to put eliminate in my report. <laughs> it didn't sound good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a little Southern Gothic. <laughs> Or we move to Fort St. John would have been mm -hmm. another statement. I, uh, I it's it's it is it's a merry-go-round. Yeah. It is a um, <laughs> it's uh, it's a it's a constant struggle and uh, it's 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 working with the system that we have. So uh, addressing you know the thing about setting initiatives which aren't set yet because we still we still are going to set those like you said that'll kind of probably answer your question a little bit. Yeah. So the thing about setting the initiatives it, is it, it's, it can be completely out of the box thinking something that's never been tried before, and uh, and it'll it'll uh, it'll address the problem of chronic repeat offenders. I don't know what that is going to be yet. Yeah. I will be the end of the week. But uh, I expect that once we have those in place, it'll, it'll answer your question. So I don't know, I don't know yet how we're going to address those ten prolific repeat chronic offenders. But we're 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 building a plan in place to address it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Damon. Appreciate it. It was good to have you here. Good to mm -hmm. see you again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, our next uh, report is from our corporate officer. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. I My first item was going to be about the by-election. Blair covered that for me, so that was great. Um, we are go working on a plan that will um, be in compliance with the social distancing um, so that we're ready when they give us the go-ahead on that. What I'm going to do is just read my paragraph I had included in regards to Chamberlain Park just for the public's information. The land agent will be concluding discussions with the remaining landowners by the end of this month. The city will provide a final letter to all residents addressing their particular situation and will indicate to those that are not cooperating that the encroachments will be removed by the city if they are still on city property after September 30th. At the writing of this report, the city has received nine offers to purchase. Twelve landowners have agreed to remove their encroachments by September 30th and the remaining eight properties are still in the negotiation stage. Following receipt of the final report from the land agent on or before June 30th, the next steps would be for council to consider formal approval regarding any offers to purchase. Staff would then complete the required advertising for notices of disposition and then proceed with rezoning the city land from park to residential as well as requesting a surveyor to complete the subdivision and cons consolidation plans. I also anticipate September 30th will be the completion date for the sales um, due to the timelines required for rezoning and co consolidation plans. Um, the other item I wanted to point out is there has been one request for additional land over and above what the city originally provided. Uh, we have provided small tweaks to the land that we originally provided, but I'm not sure how much land this landowner is asking for. We've been playing phone tag, so I haven't got his exact requirements, but if I just would like to get council's thoughts on what we had mentioned to him is that if it's a, a substantial change that he would come to council for a request. And if that's what meets with your thoughts, I'd like to know that. Council? Councillor Earl and Councillor Javadipa. Thank you, Worship. So initially, and I, <coughs> as one of the new councillors that came on board this whole process halfway-ish through, or just kind of at the early to mid stages, I know initially our hope was that with respect to selling some of the park is, is to have kind of a continuous uh, line, uh, delineation between the park and people's backyards that appears that it might not happen depending you know looking at how many people want to buy how many people are going to remove the um, hardware or, or infrastructure on there uh, my, my, pref my preference would be provided it's not too much of an outlier with respect to what's already there and it's not going to you know further undermine that attempt to keep kind of a, an even um, delineation. I, I'm I'm happy to entertain it. I guess. I don't know. Okay. Councilor Jivakla. I'd be willing to sell the whole park. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I don't have a problem with, with that. So that's a that's a soft yes from Paul. That's a soft yes. <laughs> We will follow through with the individual, as Brenda has said. We've reached out to see: are we talking a couple of feet? Or are we talking? We'll we'll sure. find out what it couple is. Couple of meters, meters, feet. Yes. Okay. All right. No other questions in regards to Chamberlain. Nope. Okay. Nope. Um, I didn't have any extra highlights on the rest of my report. So unless there's any questions. Thank you, Brenda. Councillor Jureko. I just wondered about the new format for the agendas. Um, we used to get a topic like a report and then the uh, add-ons like the reports and stuff that that we could access through the HTML. Now they're 
now they're all like how Blair likes them all in a row. So you got to <laughs> you got to scroll and scroll oh. and scroll. There, there is there is an yeah. option to still yeah go that route. I'm still fine. Oh, do you? Yes. Yeah. Just how do you do that? Have you tried I, printing it we'll off, get, Paul? We'll get you. I'll help yeah, you. I'll, I'll get you hooked up right away. So I can still access all those added uh, reports one by one. Yes. It's through the HTML version. Yeah, you I can, I can show you once we'll, we're done. We'll, we'll help you get that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Blair changed it. Yeah. Yeah. Blair <laughs> <all show. laughs> uh, anything further for Brenda? Thank you, Brenda. Our next uh, presenter is our Chief Financial Officer. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I think the only thing I would like to bring uh, uh, regarding to this report uh, is about the 2021 permissive tax exemption. So we have put on hold uh, the delegation um, because of COVID-19. But at the same time, I'm also asking council to consider if uh, we really want to go for 2021, um, starting the uh, gradual stage of tax charge or should we hold for next year and the only reason is again because of the struggle that's happening right now in the market uh, financially so I just would like Consul to start to think about uh, if we should if we should continue definitely having a meeting and delegation when there is availability uh, an opportunity to do so, but if we should start to charge these taxes next year, and the deadline to report to uh, BC assessment is by <coughs> October 31st this year, so that would be applying for next year, or if we should hold, see what's going to be the current market conditions, and then start it again next year. Could we, uh, so could by suggestion then, could we bring that report back that you presented, Flavia, when Council yep had that as a um, um, agenda item uh, yeah. at our next meeting and then council can review it refresh it and then give direction if that's what they want to do or not and okay. re, uh, validate that and I think with that report it really did a great job of outlining all of Very the different fresh. options so maybe we can just have that as an on our next agenda and we can provide that direction for you okay anything further Flavia I'm not saying only if there is any question regarding to the report. Thank you. Councils, any questions? Um, yes, I do. 2021 financial plan. That side heading. So you have a side heading under that side heading called strategic planning meeting. Um, I just want to emphasize my not concerns because I very much appreciate the direction we've moved with this with this budget um, as was well summarized by the mayor uh, earlier but um, I I do think it's uh, necessary uh, so that we are in a position of making decisions around our operating budget so we get the full benefit of a 12-month saving I'm just saying that timelines should enable, should put council in a position to, to make such a decision. Yeah. If I could just quickly add, and I think it, both the mayor and I have had a discussion about uh, beginning this process relatively soon. We're nearing the end of May. It is our intent to have the first strategic planning session in June, as we've talked about. So we'll have uh, information out to council as soon as we're able to uh, secure everybody's schedule and time frame and a location to host that meeting. Thank you. Can I go back to the yep. missive tax exemption? Yep. Uh, Dane, I think you made mention of this earlier earlier today when we were studying Ross's item on the agenda vis-a-vis -vis the lease agreements um, and it, the notion of permissive tax exemptions uh, and the city uh, we, we removed them from the list whether that was still a, a valid valid thing because it's all 
And so many, many groups are, are helped by that permissive tax exemption. I'm talking about the non-statutory ones. But it seems to me that with all these, many of these organizations, the quality of life in the community is, is impacted by the services they provide. And um, I just think when we talk about that permissive tax stuff, uh, we ne need to look at um, impacts that uh, might happen in the community if those institutions were not functioning. And it's a hard thing, uh, hard thing to, to gauge. And uh, I think particularly of the Dawson Creek Athletic Association, you know, Right now, and I stand to be corrected, Paul, they, they, they're pretty well property owners, but the operation of what happens on their property is, is independent of them. The, you know, the golf course is its own board of directors, Ski Hill. But I think as we look at the future, and we look at the direction that uh, we must take I'm sort of um, here reflecting a statement that our former former CAO used to used to say that uh, ultimately uh, the community has to do more for itself and the city less. And so uh, it's a big topic, but I'm looking at can we reawaken some partnerships that some organisations can be more engaged in providing recreation and the city less engaged. And that needs to be measured with permissive tax exemptions. There's so many things that are interrelated. It, and that's why it, it makes it somewhat of a, a complicated topic. You know, um, where do we follow? Because if we don't have some initiatives in mind as it relates to the future picture of recreation in this community, post-COVID, post-Peace River Accord. Uh, we've got a plan in, with that in mind, right? And how do we move to that condition that we might be facing? So it's just ramblings, but it, it's, a, it's a big concern. One action leads to another, and sometimes, like, I'm a firm believer, you know, as was exhibited with the state park uh, that involved you, Blair. If we can engage people and constructively, uh, we've got great people in this town, some wonderful organizations that have done a lot over the years. If we can become part of, the, in a, of make doing what they're doing, but also maybe in different ways, uh, we can still make keep this the best place to live in the peace country. I'm sure, I'm sure we can do that. Sorry. Thank you. Nope, that's good. Uh, anything further for Flavi? Thank you. Next, we have uh, a report from our general manager of development services. This morning, Kevin. So I'll touch on a few things in the report. Um, as we're moving into spring, we're kind of moving into uh, projects and whatnot. So that's uh, a few of those are obviously highlighted in the report. Uh, I'll touch on a couple. Uh, Bear Hole Lake Weir, um, just for council's information, that project is uh, as a result of some requirements from Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural resource operations. We need to make some changes to the ladder because it's not working properly. So that project's a bit unique and a bit of a challenge because of the location and, and windows of opportunity that we can do that work. So what we're doing um, in 2020 is we're going through some approval processes and we're getting some of the, uh, the fish ladder actually welded and constructed here in town and likely we're going to have to push the remainder of the project to 21 just because there's a very small window of opportunity with different species and things like that and so um, that'll be ongoing um, a 
one uh, one other item here in the uh, projects was uh, our SAGR system. We were looking at doing some work uh, this year regarding a few upgrades to the SAGR, which was really more around the systems and controls and, and some metering so we could uh, have some data captured and, and be enable us to operate it a little more efficiently. But we've actually tendered this project twice, and both times it's come significantly over the budget. So we we didn't move forward with it. We didn't bring it forward to council, and, and we're going to have to rethink what we're doing on that. I mean, we're obviously able to operate it, and that's fine, but this would have just gave us a, a few more abilities to be a little bit more, like I say, efficient and some more data to enable us to make some, some de decisions in a different manner. So that project is on hold for, for the time being until we can rethink what we're going to do there. Uh, a couple of notes uh, in the building department. I just wanted to highlight that uh, April is pretty slow, but May has uh, picked up significantly. So things are happening out there. So that's that's good news. Um, we've had conversations with the hotel uh, development across Alaska Avenue here, and um, they've they've indicated that they will start up again here uh, sometime soon. So that's that's hopeful. Um, and finally, in that area, I just wanted to note that uh, Bill Darnbro, our, our building inspector, is working his way through his levels, and he's uh, hoping to have his level three completed uh, this year sometime, hopefully by early fall or completion of fall. So that's really good news for us, as uh, level three is kind of the top level for building inspection. So that would be a great, great achievement and a great asset for the city. So congrats to him on that uh, hard work. Uh, in the engineering area, um, as most of you have probably seen, we've started uh, construction on 15th Street. Uh, Peter Brothers was in there last week, milled a portion of the road, and uh, the underground contractor is in there today starting work in that area, and they will be kind of staggering that as they go, uh, trying not to close uh, too much of the road, any one portion of the road at one time. The idea is that uh, they'll try and concentrate in one block at a time and, and work everything there. So that's that's underway, so that's good news. Wanted to note that the RV Sandy Dump uh, is, is and has been open for a period of time, but uh, we did get the water turned on uh, to the site last week and I know there was a lot of people that were concerned about um, not having water um, but it was simply just a matter of uh, the ground was still cold we were still having some evenings where it was freezing at night and if we were to turn it on and have meters there they were just likely to break and we were back in there fixing those so typically uh, and historically we, we never turn the water on until after the May long weekend which we did but uh, we had a few people that were concerned with that so that's the challenges of where we live, but uh, it is up and operating now um, and uh, moving forward. So, And just another couple notes with the, the watershed program. So during spring runoff, we um, they installed a monitor at 17th and 102nd there. Some of you may have seen a little uh, tripod kind of off in the grass area. So what's that, that is doing is that, that's uh, measuring the uh, levels of the creek, which was a great uh, piece of information during during runoff. We were able to determine and, and see that, uh, you know, it peaked on Friday the 17th at 1 p.m. and we were able to watch that curve as it came up and then as it started to drop. So again, that gives us some great information. Um, and just tying in with those high flows, um, something that you're probably not aware of is so when we get those rain events, creeks come up. Uh, we also have a lot of infiltration into our sanitary system, which in turn puts a lot uh, heavier load on lift stations and also the lagoons, which then in turn ends up uh, pushing a lot more of that uh, liquid out, discharging out the back end of the lagoon. So um, typically in events like we saw over the, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we exceed our permit at the lagoons. Uh, and so if we do exceed our permit, we then have to go out and do flow calculations on the creek to determine that the creek is running to a certain level that because of our discharge we are meeting adequate dilution. So um, 
when we get those events, uh, we, we do have some extra measures that we need to do. We have to go out on site um, and do flow calculations every few days, and we need to provide that information to the ministry. So, um, again, last week we were, I think our permit allows a discharge of 7,600 cubic meters a day, and we were right around 87 or 8,900 in a 24 hour period. So, we were beyond our permits. We have to go do those full monitorings. And, make sure the creek's running to a certain point. So just a point of interest. That's all I had in the report uh, that I wanted to highlight, but I'm certainly open to any questions you might have. Thank you, Kevin. Councilor Parcel? Yes, uh, Sudeten Hall, from city's perspective, uh, how is that project going? Um, the, base, the, the, the repairs. Yeah, the repairs, yeah. So all that I'm aware of, and I haven't had any updates other than we received the information and we had what we needed and as far and the building permit was was issued i haven't heard specifically of any details or if, if bills even been called in to take a look at it as of yet so i'm not sure yeah the reason i'm asking it was uh, uh as i said earlier today i was at the mile zero park meeting via zoom um i guess uh, the principal in uh, bear mountain construction is not in the country right now but his foreman was looking after that project and um, one of the requirements was that the um, adjustable support poles had to be all new and that money was uh, found by borrowing by the Mile Zero Park Society so I assume that things were going to happen uh, but that I haven't heard since so that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. One last question yep. deals with raw water. Um, where's that issue around um, connectivity, people connecting with that raw water, living in rural areas? Um, I've lost track of where that issue is. We were, you know, we were concerned about liability issues and people using it for domestic purposes. Yeah. Have you got any updates on that? I can provide an update, Your Worship, on that. Um, two distinct, the Sandy Sewer, th that is fresh water we're talking about down there that people use. Yes. So just uh, the, the raw water line and the hookup for individuals that live along that, we have a discussion planned. I believe it was June 3rd is the date. I know they're trying to secure that with the director that represents that rural area that we'll have discussions with him moving forward on that. Thank you. Anything further for Kevin? Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And 14.5, we have a report from the General Manager of Community Services. Good morning, Ross. Good morning, Your Worship. Again, Council members. Well, it's been almost two and a half months, I think, at this point in time since we began closing our facilities. Um, and I think it's safe to say that the general public, probably ourselves, are pretty keen to see things happening. Um, in terms of parks and recreation, I feel quite fortunate in that the parks and recreation um, practitioners, professionals, the BC Recreation and Parks Association, Association the uh, Rec Facilities Association of BC, Life Saving Association, via sport, are informing our province uh, regarding safe opening of facilities so there's a flurry of information um, that's coming out and as early as this morning I received an update from the Recreation and Parks Association and now they've gone to a four-step plan to reopen. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. Our staff have been participating in all nature of calls with these associations and putting plans together. Um, it's almost to the point of information overload to try and digest this stuff and, and determine you know what our safe protocols are going to be but I think we're well on the way um, we uh, our skate park is open our play our playgrounds we hope uh, will open near the end of this week first thing next week um, our tennis courts are open um, I don't believe that our indoor facilities uh, are, are going to open anytime soon. Um, I think that uh, we'll start opening, you know, our, our parks to potentially some, some recreation sport. 
non-contact sport, not league games, that sort of thing probably will take place this year. But when we start thinking about um, hockey and the swimming pool, there are there are some pretty serious considerations to be made in terms of how we can be safe in those facilities. And the other the other comment or discussion that we're having internally is really um, what do the protocols look like, i.e. cleaning buildings. If we put people in the swim, swimming pool, do we, do we lease out a lane per person um, in a public swim? Is the swim club the only group that gets to go into that building at any given time? What protocols are we going to be faced with in terms of cleaning in between those, those programs? And so really we need to determine a, a good business case. But I guess my point this morning is I think those indoor facilities are a couple of months off yet before uh, we're really going to consider opening those things up. So. Um, we have, uh, I believe as of this morning, we have recalled 10 um, seasonal staff. I believe we have seven or eight of those staff that are actually on site uh, to start um, initiating our summer acti activities, i.e. mowing, trimming, uh, maintenance on trails and trees and those sorts of things. So I think we're going to be scrambling this year. You've seen all the rain we have. We've got some this week, so the grass is going to be going like crazy. So. We're going to try and stay on top of that type of uh, work. Um, the hanging baskets did arrive last week, and I suspect we'll start seeing those up momentarily here. Um, in terms of the recreation or recreation programs, again, it was middle, early March that we started closing those facilities. We've uh, We've had to cancel all of our programming. We've had to refund in the neighborhood of $5,000 in programs. And we've held off on uh, signing up for swimming lessons and climbing walls and you know our summer programs, some of which we will continue to try and do. But uh, anything indoors uh, is fine at the moment. Um, Councillor Earl spoke about the cleanup campaign earlier today. I think a huge success and, and hats off to our staff who had to coordinate this this initiative through video conferencing this year. So pretty interesting to have to reach out to the community groups and, and go through not only what our expectations are and what the areas look like, but how we can remain safe. So we've had really good buy-in from the groups and I think quite successful in, in completing that program. Um, just of note, as we do think about reopening pools and arenas, uh, training for our staff, I'll use the pool as an example, um, we need to land on a date sooner than later, or an estimate opening. We anticipate anywhere between four to six weeks to prepare the pool, to train the staff, to ensure the staff have been recertified, to get back open, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a crapshoot at times here trying to really land on a you know on a date and trying to forecast when we might be able to get into those situations so um, and obviously we talked about the facility leases I'll have a fair amount of work now um, to get going on uh, building some information uh, for that criteria so we'll leave it at that this morning great stuff thank you Ross questions yes Councillor Parcel another question I was uh, asked at at this meeting uh, concerned Rotary Lake, um, given its status, um, and I was wondering if, in our long-term planning, uh, whether we shouldn't uh, make steps to uh, deal with removing the the basin that's there, as it's as when it's not going to be opened as a lake, and. Uh, we build into long-term planning again how we might expand that spla the, the splash part so it becomes a, a bit of a more of a water attraction for the community. So I said that was, I, so my response, right, was it's up in the air, uh, uh, but stay tuned, Ross will be in touch. <laughs> so uh, try to talk to uh, is Dale Campbell. But they, I thought they were all reasonable questions, right? Uh, Certainly, thank you. Through your worship, uh, Councillor, I, I will be bringing a report to the next closed meeting, speaking a little bit toward the next steps. 
Um, I think that's fair to start planning for that, that you know that piece of land and what we're going to be doing with that. So definitely on our radar at this point. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Blair? I think just following through on Ross's report, the one thing as um, the opportunity to consider reopening our facilities becomes clearer to us, I think the one consideration council will have to um, mull over is based on what the criteria is to reopen. If you can only put 25 patrons into a swimming pool, for example, at, at what point is, is council's engagement going to say we're willing to do that or so on. So uh, this will be more than just saying this is what you have to do to open them. I think there will be a, a healthy discussion at council to see um, how and if and when uh, that takes place once we have the criteria that we need to open them. So I yeah. just want you to be aware of that discussion that will be forthcoming. It might be worthwhile for us to anticipate that we may be put some parameters around usage that we look at, just maybe have Flavia bring us back that annual uh, revenue from fees and charges for the pool, because we're going to have a delta then in terms of what what is the gap now going to increase if we are placed in that, and maybe just for council to have an understanding of what it is and monthly that we were receive in revenue from the pool for fees and charges, because you can certainly expect that to reduce. So. All right. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. <coughs> uh, so that's it for our open uh, motion to recess to closed. Councillor Javakov. Oh, sorry, Brenda. Yeah, through your worship, just to add that additional item. Oh, right. Councillor Parslow had one that he wanted to uh, add in for um, the legal update. A legal update. Yeah, so that would be item number 5.2 in um, as per section 91G of the community charter. Thank you. Move to, uh, recess to close. Councillor Javakov, Councillor Earl. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. So we'll take a five minute recess.